Bookcraft is pleased to present a recording by Gordon T. Allred entitled Visits to the Spirit World. I spoke before a large gathering of young people at the Weber State University Union Building in Ogden, Utah. The occasion was an LDS youth conference conducted by a stake from Idaho. The assigned title of my lecture, You Are Eternal. By way of introduction, I related in brief what has now become one of the best-known accounts in Mormon history regarding a visit to the spirit world. The story appeared in the Improvement Era, September and October 1929, under the title Raised from the Dead, and was written by Leroy C. Snow, son of the former church president and prophet Lorenzo Snow. It recounts the experience of a young woman in Brigham City named Mary Ellen Jensen, better known as Ella, who died of scarlet fever, spent some three hours in the spirit world, then returned to mortality thanks to a remarkable blessing at the hands of that same prophet. I then referred to the ever-growing evidence for such experiences, touching upon certain other examples involving members of the Mormon Church, and concluded by discussing three of the most influential non-LDS works ever written on the subject, Life After Life, and The Light Beyond by Dr. Raymond A. Moody, and Return from Tomorrow by Dr. George Ritchie. The first two books involve the results of studies by Moody of people who have died and entered the spirit realm, then returned to their bodies in many cases because of medical resuscitation. They are based in large measure upon interviews he has conducted with well over a thousand such individuals and have exerted a powerful, positive impact upon public attitude in that connection. The same holds true to a somewhat lesser extent for George Ritchie's Return from Tomorrow. This latter work, however, relates at length Ritchie's own personal experience, focusing upon his guided tour of the spirit realms by a divine being specifically identified as the Son of God himself. My young listeners at the youth conference were all highly attentive, and during my remarks I told them that I had never yet spoken to a group on other world experiences without collecting at least one more from someone afterward, either a direct personal account or one my informant had heard from someone else. When I concluded, however, the entire gathering promptly headed for the lunch awaiting them in the UB cafeteria. All of them, that is, except the sister in charge who had introduced me. She had been one of my students about 20 years earlier there at Weber State and was now young women's president over the stake holding that conference. Well, I said and smiled somewhat ruefully, it looks as if I'm drawing a blank for once. Can't compete with a hungry stomach. No, you haven't, she laughed. Not if you have time to listen. During the half hour or so that followed, she related not one, but five such accounts. The first involved her mother. The second was her own. During the delivery of her seventh child, she had hemorrhaged severely and died. Following a brief separation from her body, however, she had reluctantly returned to mortality because of concern for her family, a newborn infant. A third account involved one of her friends, a man who had spent some time on the other side, encountered various church leaders there who had died long before and received a blessing from one of them. Accounts of those who have died then returned to their bodies are indeed abundant, both in the world at large and certainly within the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In my following remarks, I will discuss the Ella Jensen story raised from the dead, perhaps the most renowned and detailed LDS account of its kind. I will also elaborate regarding the works mentioned by Drs. Moody and Ritchie. Finally, I will discuss several accounts of that general nature related to me personally by members of the Church. About three or four o'clock in the morning, I was suddenly awakened by Ella calling me. I hurried to her bed. She was all excited and asked me to get the comb, brush, and scissors explaining that she wanted to brush her hair and trim her fingernails and get all ready, for, she said, they are coming to get me at ten o'clock in the morning. I asked, who? 
was coming to get her. Uncle Hans Jensen, she replied, and the messengers. I am going to die, and they are coming for me at ten o'clock. I tried to quiet her, saying that she would feel better in the morning if she would try to sleep. But no, she said, I am not ready. She insisted that I get the comb, hairbrush, and scissors, which I did, but she was so weak that she could not use them. Thus begins the account raised from the dead to which I have just referred. It is one which I have drawn upon extensively in the following discussion, an account so well supported by credible witnesses that it is indeed entitled to an honored place among the great miracles of this dispensation. The year was 1891. The place, Brigham City, Utah. The words, those of a young woman named Leah Reese. For several weeks now, Ella Jensen, age 19, had hovered near death from scarlet fever, and her good friend Leah was spending the night by her bedside in order to relieve Ella's weary parents from their long hours of worry and care. Leah was, in fact, one of several kind neighbors who had accepted that responsibility, and at times, during her visit, she had sung for her ailing friend, accompanying herself on an old-fashioned harmonium. On the night referred to, Leah reports, Ella asked me to sing and play for her, but, goodness, I was so worried about her condition, I felt more like crying. I sat down at the organ and began to play and sing, but broke down and had to quit. Afterward, Ella went to sleep, and Leah lay down on the couch in the same room and also dropped off herself. It was some hours later that Ella awakened her with that seemingly strange report about the visit of her deceased Uncle Hans and the other messengers from the spirit world. Leah, as might be imagined, was rather skeptical about what she had heard, supposing perhaps that her friend had been dreaming or was merely delirious. Nevertheless, she did as requested, obtaining a comb, hairbrush, and scissors, and attended to Ella's needs. As I was brushing her hair, she explains, she asked me to call her parents. I explained that they were tired and asleep, and that it would be better not to disturb them. Ella, however, was insistent, and Leah acquiesced. Ella's father and mother were soon at her bedside, hearing the same story she had told her friend. According to Ella, Uncle Hans and the others had definitely visited her. No, not a dream or a hallucination, she insisted. She had been fully awake at the time, fully aware, eyes wide open, nor was she going to sleep any more. Ella told them, reiterating that she would die and go to the other side at ten o'clock the next morning. Throughout the brief remaining hours, Ella continued to fade, and by eight a.m., friends and relatives who had heard of her condition were gathering at her bedside. At about nine-thirty, her brother Bud was sent to obtain a woman known informally as Dr. Nelson, who spent much of her time waiting upon the sick and acting as a midwife. Shortly afterward, Ella was failing very rapidly, enough so that she began to embrace friends and relatives and bid them farewell. Simultaneously, however, she was struggling with all her will, gasping for breath, yet determined to remain in mortality until her brother returned, and until the arrival of her grandma Jensen, who had also been delayed. The two of them, along with Dr. Nelson, arrived with only minutes to spare, barely in time, in fact, for a final embrace and a loving word or two of parting. Ella then fell back in the throes of death. Her father, Jacob Jensen, was holding her hand and felt the pulse diminish and cease. Althea, he said, turning to his wife, Ella is dead. Her pulse has stopped. The long ordeal had ended, and now the tears began to flow. A short while afterward, Jacob hitched up the horse and buggy and journeyed to the LDS tabernacle in town, a mile or so distant. A state conference was underway there, presided over by the president of the church himself, Lorenzo Snow, who was also Ella's uncle through marriage, husband of Jacob's sister Minnie. Jacob's purpose, however, was simply to inform President Snow of what had occurred and obtain his help as convenient in arranging for the funeral. President Snow was speaking to the congregation at the time, but upon receiving Jacob's note, excused himself, 
explaining that he had been called upon to assist some people who were greatly bereaved. As Jacob Jensen reports, President Snow came into the vestry, and after I told him what had happened, he meditated a moment or two, then said, I will go down with you. Just as we were about to leave, President Snow stopped me, saying, Wait a moment. I wish you would go into the meeting and get Brother Clausen. I want him to go also. President Clausen was then president of the Box Elder Stake, but later became an apostle and was president of the Council of the Twelve. By the time they arrived at the Jensen home, Sister Nelson had washed Ella's body and laid it out, as they say, for viewing, as was the custom in those times, since embalming procedures were then unknown in many places and still in their infancy. Friends and neighbors had begun gathering to offer condolences. Clearly, there was no question in the minds of all who saw her that Ella was truly dead a fact strongly reinforced by the following explanation from President Rudger Clausen. As we entered the home, we met Sister Jensen, who was very much agitated and alarmed. We came to Ella's bedside and were impressed by the thought that her spirit had passed out of her body and gone beyond. In consequence, all those present at the time, including Rudger Clausen, were undoubtedly much amazed when President Snow asked whether there was any consecrated oil in the home, and proceeded to administer to Ella's remains. In the words of her father Jacob, after standing at Ella's bedside for a minute or two, President Snow asked if we had any consecrated oil in the house. I was greatly surprised, but told him yes, and got it for him. To this, President Clausen adds, Turning to me, President Snow said, Brother Clausen, Will you anoint her? Which I did. We then laid our hands upon her head, and the anointing was confirmed by President Snow, who blessed her, and among other things used this very extraordinary expression in a commanding tone of voice. Come back, Ella, come back. Your work upon the earth is not yet completed. Come back. Shortly afterward, we left the home. At that point, however, nothing else had happened. To all appearances, Ella had not responded in any way, whatever, to the blessing. Her eyes remained closed, her body mute, cold, and motionless. To put it bluntly, the young woman was still as dead as ever. Nevertheless, President Snow seemed totally unruffled and confident, advising the bewildered parents to be calm and cease their grieving. It will be all right, he promised. Brother Clausen and I are busy and must go. We cannot stay, but you just be patient and wait, and do not mourn, because it will be all right. It was now about noontime, two hours after Ella's passing, and one can only conjecture regarding the conflicting feelings of her family and parents. Undoubtedly, they had great faith in President Snow. Yet they were now being left on their own with no visible results whatever. For the next hour they remained at Ella's side while the news of her passing circulated throughout the town. Friends continued to call and express their sympathy. And then a marvelous thing happened, a mighty miracle. We were sitting there, watching by the bedside, her mother and myself, Jacob relates, when all at once she opened her eyes. She looked about the room, saw us sitting there, but still looked for someone else. And the first thing she said was, Where is he? Where is he? we asked. Who? Where is who? Why, Brother Snow, she replied. He called me back. Upon hearing that Presidents Snow and Clausen had returned to their responsibilities at the state conference, Ella dropped her head back upon the pillow, murmuring, Why did he call me back? I was so happy did not want to come back. At about this point, several of Ella's friends arrived, intending to express their sympathy and offer assistance, but upon entering the Jensen home were astounded to hear her voice. Ella had, in fact, just begun to recount the events surrounding her death and visit to the spirit realm. Even before her departure, she relates, I could see people, 
from the other world and hear the most delightful music and singing that I had ever heard. The singing lasted for six hours, during which time I was preparing to leave this earth, and I could hear it all throughout the house. She then describes the experience of leaving her body and looking back upon it as the family hovered about in their sorrow. It took me some time to make up my mind to go, she explains, as I could hear and see the folks crying and mourning over me. It was very hard for me to leave them. But as soon as I had a glimpse of the other world, I was anxious to go, and all care and worry left me. Her account continues. I entered a large hall. It was so long that I could not see the end of it. It was filled with people. As I went through the throng, the first person I recognized was my grandpa, H.P. Jensen, who was sitting in one end of the room writing. He looked up and seemed surprised to see me and said, Why, there's my granddaughter, Ella. He was very much pleased, greeted me, and as he continued with his writing, I passed on through the room, met a great many of my relatives and friends. It was like going along the crowded street of a large city where you meet many people, only a few of whom you actually recognize. Ella then speaks of meeting her Uncle Hans, the being who had appeared during the night, summoning her to the other side. Hans was accompanied by his wife Mary Ellen and two small children, one who was their own, the other a daughter of his brother Will. Many of those people she encountered seemed to be in family groups. Some were complete strangers, others friends and relatives. One, a cousin, asked about the welfare of those Ella had recently left and said he regretted that, quote, some of the boys were using tobacco, liquor, and many things that were injurious to them, unquote. This proved to me, Ella relates, that people in the other world know to a great extent what happens here upon the earth. Everyone she met appeared, quote, perfectly happy, unquote, and all were arrayed in white or cream except for Uncle Hans, who, odd as it may seem, perhaps even amusing, was still clad in the rubber boots and the fishing garb worn at the time of his disappearance and drowning on the Snake River in Idaho some years earlier. This apparent incongruity will be discussed later, but the happy visiting continued, and at one point Ella entered a room filled with hundreds of young children, convened, as she puts it, in a sort of primary or Sunday school presided over by Aunt Eliza R. Snow. It was then, as Ella listened to the children singing, gladly meeting, kindly greeting, that she heard the voice of President Snow summoning her back to mortality. In the words of Rudger Clausen, she heard a voice coming to her in a commanding tone, apparently from a long distance, which said, Come back, Ella. Come back. Your work upon the earth is not yet completed. She had no desire to come back and felt determined not to leave that beautiful place. But this voice was so authoritative in manner that it seemed to draw, yes, actually did draw her spirit out of that room. She was compelled to follow it, and so she turned her face earthward on the return journey. She kept going and going, apparently a long distance, until all at once she found herself in the room at home where her body was lying. Then she realized that her spirit must again enter the body which was lying there, to all intents and purposes a lifeless one. Her spirit entered, and the next moment her eyes opened and her lips moved. Then it was her parents realized that she was no longer dead. They spoke to her, and she to them. Ella herself speaks of departing the spirit world and of bidding those she had met farewell, quote, though it was very much against my nature, as such perfect peace and happiness prevailed there. No suffering, no sorrow. I was so taken up with all I saw and heard, I did hate to leave that beautiful place. She then goes on to speak of the comfort derived from that experience and her conviction that we should not grieve much over the death of loved ones, especially at the time they leave us. Because as I was leaving, she explains, the only Regret I had was that the folks were grieving so much for me. But I soon forgot all about this world in my delight with the other. Odd though it may seem, Ella's return to her body was far more traumatic than her departure from it. 
Ella frequently told of the terrible suffering which she experienced when her spirit again entered her body, according to her sister Maida. As Leroy C. Snow explains in his account on the subject, there was practically no pain upon leaving the body in death, but the intense pain was almost unbearable in coming back to life. Not only this, but for months and even years afterward, she experienced new aches and pains and physical disorders that she had never known before. Despite the fact that his daughter had clearly died and gone to the spirit world for approximately three hours, Jacob Jensen initially found her account of what had happened there incredible. He even whispered to his wife, quote, that the girl is delirious, she's out of her mind, unquote. Ella overheard him, however, and promptly countered by describing two aunts whom she had visited with on the other side. One of them had died shortly after she was born, the other some time before. The former, her Aunt Mary, was identified as, quote, a tall woman with black hair and dark eyes and thin features, unquote. The latter, her Aunt Sarah, as, quote, somewhat fleshy with round features, light hair and blue eyes, unquote. Both descriptions were emphatically confirmed by Ella's mother, and upon hearing their exchange, her father promptly changed his attitude. Do you now think I'm out of my mind, father? Ella challenged. No, came the reply. You have had a very wonderful experience. Later, when Ella's aunt Harriet White arrived for a visit, Ella comforted her greatly by telling of her visit with two of Harriet's deceased daughters, assuring her that there was no need whatever to weep over their loss. I saw and talked with them, she said, and they were very happy where they are. Many other relatives and friends received the same basic assurance regarding loved ones of their own who had died and entered the spirit world. Ella's friend, Leah Reese, who had been with her at the time of her summons in the dark hours of that morning, was also comforted and encouraged to learn that Ella had visited with her father and other family members. Of all Ella's encounters and experiences in the spirit world, however, only one struck her as perplexing. The following by Alfonso H. Snow, one of President Lorenzo Snow's sons, explains. My wife Minnie and I had heard of Ella's death and restoration to life and called at her home to see her. As we entered the room, she said, Oh, come here, Alfonso and Minnie, I have something to tell you. After my return to the earth, I told my parents of some remarkable experiences which I had while in the spirit world. But there was one experience that seemed very strange, and I could not understand it. You know your little son, Alfie, has been in my Sunday school class in the first ward. I've always loved him very much. While I was in Aunt Eliza R. Snow's class of children in the spirit world, I recognized many children but all of them had died, excepting one. And this was little Alfie. I could not understand how he should be among them and still be living. When I told this to Mother, she said, Yes, Ella, little Alfie is dead, too. He died early this morning, and while you were so very, very sick. We knew you loved him, and that it would be a shock to you, so we did not tell you about his death. Needless to say, Ella's account was highly consoling to Alfie's bereaved parents and furnishes compelling verification of her experiences on the other side. Surely, in any event, it would appear in the words of Lorenzo Snow that Ella Jensen's time on earth was not yet up. She later was called as president of the Young Ladies Mutual Improvement Association in Brigham City, married and became the mother of eight children, and also became a prominent figure in her community. When death came the second time, Ella was an old woman, having lived a rich and rewarding life. Ella's story, in one sense, is a very common one, for there are thousands of people within the church and millions throughout the world who claim to have undergone similar experiences. On the other hand, it is quite uncommon in terms of its length and detail especially in light of the fact that Ella was literally raised from the dead by the president of the church and because of the many reliable witnesses involved. Following are some points worth pondering in that latter connection. 
Uncle Hans's messenger. To begin with, it is interesting to note that Ella was summoned to the other side by the spirit of her Uncle Hans Jensen, her father Jacob's brother, because Hans had apparently returned to earth previously on at least two other occasions. As Rudger Clausen relates, the night that Hans Jensen disappeared, his mother, Grandma Jensen, awakened her son Willard by calling in her Danish accent, Bill, Bill, you get right up and open the door and let Hans in the house. Willard came to his mother's bedside, saying, Why, Mother Hans cannot be here. He is up in Idaho, fishing. Yes, but I know he is here. I heard him calling me. I have not been asleep. I know he's outside and wants to come in. Willard went to the door, opened it, walked entirely around the house, returned to his mother and said he was sure that Hans was not there. The mother replied, Then Hans is dead, because I know that he came to me and called me. A few days later, word came telling of Hans's disappearance. After Hans had disappeared, his brother Jacob, Ella's father, journeyed to Idaho and organized a searching party that spent an unsuccessful two or three weeks looking for his body along the Snake River. The following observation, however, by Dorothy Schimmelfenig, a relative of the Jensen family, offers some fascinating elaboration. Besides the manifestation that Hans's mother had, the brother Ephraim also had an experience that indicated satisfactorily to the family that Hans was drowned in the Snake River. After the searching party had left Idaho, Ephraim stayed on to continue the hunt. He finally made a vow with God that he would not leave, nor cease his prayer until he received an answer. After long and earnest prayer, Hans came to Ephraim and confirmed the fact that he had drowned. He also told him how happy and contented he was in the spirit world and advised Ephraim to return to Utah without spending more time looking for the body. The preceding information was obtained from Dorothy Schimmelfenig, from Ephraim's daughter, Phyllis Dunnigan, and is contained in a letter which she sent to me some years ago. Certainly, it is consistent with what we know of Uncle Hans's modus operandi as a spirit, at the very least, most interesting. More substantial evidence is as follows. Ella's description of her two deceased aunts. It is possible that Ella's description of her two deceased aunts might have been derived from information supplied earlier or perhaps photographs. If this be true, however, the mother's request that Ella describe her aunts in such delighted responses as, why, yes, Ella, that is your Aunt Sarah. You have described her perfectly, seem incongruous and strangely contrived. Even though the descriptions are fairly brief, for example, rather short and somewhat fleshy, with round features, light hair, and blue eyes, they assume significance when people attempt to describe deceased relatives whom they have never known in mortality. On one occasion, I interviewed ten people regarding grown aunts and uncles who had died before the people in question were born. Of this number... Only two could provide any descriptions whatever, and those descriptions were less detailed than either of those given by Ella. Ella's awareness of young Alfie's presence in the spirit world and her perplexity over the matter, as will be recalled from our previous comments, Ella had recognized several children in the spirit world, and as she erroneously supposed, quote, all of them had died except one, and this was little Alfie. I could not understand how he should be among them and still be living. Remember, however, her mother's response. Yes, Ella, little Alfie is dead too. He died early this morning while you were so very sick. We knew that you loved him and that it would be a shock to you, so we did not tell you about his death. This aspect of Ella's story regarding the other side is perhaps the most significant of all. If Ella had merely been in a deep coma dreaming, fantasizing, or delirious, how can one explain this particular aspect of the account? Ella's prediction that she would die at a specific time was fulfilled. As we stated earlier, Ella awakened her friend Leah about 3 a.m. with the announcement that, quote, they are coming to get me at 10 o'clock in the morning, unquote. 
the time of departure was even reiterated. I'm going to die, and they are coming at ten o'clock to take me away. Ella was so convinced of this that she insisted upon awakening her weary parents who, quote, thought she was delirious and tried to get her to be quiet and go back to sleep, unquote. Despite all this, the ailing girl persisted in maintaining that she would soon die, began combing her hair and tidying up for her visitors from the unseen world, and she, quote, wanted to see all the folks and bid them goodbye, unquote. The following sentence is especially significant. Toward ten o'clock, the father, who was holding his daughter's hand, felt the pulse become very weak. A few moments later, he turned to his wife, saying, Althea, she is dead. Her pulse has stopped. There was no question in the mind of anyone involved that Ella had truly died at the time predicted. Ella's father, who actually felt her pulse stop, Rudger Clausen and President Snow, who were, quote, impressed by the thought that her spirit had passed out of her body and gone beyond, unquote. Dr. Nelson, who prepared her body for viewing and burial, and the many concerned friends who came to express their condolences. Dorothy Schimmelfennig's letter referred to earlier is also enlightening regarding the condition and handling of Ella's body. Referring to Dr. Nelson's actions in that connection, she explains, According to the Union Mortuary in Bountiful, embalming began in Salt Lake City in 1905 and 1906, the smaller communities soon following suit. Ella's death took place in 1891, some time before embalming became the custom. The time of her experience, preparation for burial, was referred to as laying out, or to lay out. March's Thesaurus Dictionary gives the definition of lay out as to dress in grave clothes and place in a decent posture. This is exactly what was done for Ella. Sister Nelson took the next proper step following death. She washed the body and dressed it for burial. She laid it out. To this... Dorothy Schimmelfennig adds, Again, it was the custom to sit by the body from the moment it was laid out until it was interred. Family and friends took turns sitting by the body throughout the night. It was necessary to apply cold compresses on the body to keep it in good condition until the funeral and burial. Note also that, quote, the news of the death spread about the city. Friends continued to call at the home, express their sympathy to the sorrowing parents, and leave, unquote. The parents considered her dead, and so did the entire community. They were viewing the body, and the parents were in the usual reception line. Abundance of reliable witnesses. There are innumerable accounts of people who have died, gone to the spirit world, then returned to their mortal bodies, both people inside the church and outside, as we have said. Few, however, are so detailed, and perhaps none, so powerfully supported in terms of witnesses. In his article, Raised from the Dead, to which I have referred, Leroy C. Snow lists 12 people who were involved with Ella one way or another from the time of her death to her return to life. President Snow, Leah Reese, Jacob Jensen, Grandma Jensen, Rudger Clausen, Hattie Critchlow, Dr. Nelson, Bud Jensen, Maida Jensen Cheney, Harriet White, Alfonso Snow, and Minnie Snow. Many others, including Ella's mother, Althea, additional family members, relatives, and friends, were also involved. Of those listed above, however, the following six individuals are all quoted in the article regarding some significant aspect of Ella's experience. Leah Reese, Ella Jensen, Jacob Jensen, Rudger Clausen, Lorenzo Snow, and Alfonso Snow. All in all, a truly impressive array of witnesses, including, most importantly, of course, the president of the church himself, through whom the miraculous blessing was imparted and realized. A fulfillment of prophecy regarding President Snow and his power to raise the dead. What happened that memorable day on March 3, 1891, came in partial fulfillment to a prophecy given many years before in the Kirtland Temple. Kirtland, Ohio, when Lorenzo Snow, who was then only 22 years old, received a blessing at the hands of Joseph Smith, Sr., father of the prophet. 
Among other things, he was given these promises. Thou shalt become a mighty man. Thy faith shall increase and grow stronger until it shall become like Peter's. Thou shalt restore the sick. The diseased shall send thee their aprons and handkerchiefs, and by thy touch their owners shall be made whole. The dead shall rise and come forth at thy bidding. Despite its remarkable nature, and the powerful evidence in that connection, Ella's story leaves us with some interesting questions. Why, for example, did Uncle Hans still appear to be wearing his fishing garb in the spirit realms when all the others were clad in white or cream? The thought that Uncle Hans would spend his disembodied years striding about the spirit world in his hip boots and bib overalls seems a bit ludicrous, to say the least. Rudger Clausen, however, offers this helpful explanation. It has been said that when the dead manifest themselves to the living, they usually appear as they were last seen on earth, so that the living will recognize them. If that be true, it accounts for the strange habit her uncle was wearing. Most of the family members, Hans's mother and brother Ephraim in particular, were already aware that Hans had died while salmon fishing. Nevertheless, according to President Clausen, there may have been some question in that respect for some of them that was later resolved because of the way Hans revealed himself to Ella. Other questions arise. Why, for example, did Ella encounter little children in the spirit world? If, as church doctrine assures us, our spirits themselves actually attained adult stature before leaving their first estate and coming here. Possibly, though I am merely conjecturing, the process of returning to full adult stature upon entry into the spirit world is simply not immediate or automatic, but rather a gradual one, much as the physical body must undergo its own gradual development here upon the earth. More important, perhaps, why are some people allowed to die in the first place? If, in the words of President Snow, Ella's mission on earth was not yet up. Speculation here is even more difficult. Do people on the other side sometimes make mistakes in programming, just as they do here? Were Uncle Hans and the others who summoned Ella that memorable night in 1891 in error, possibly through some kind of communications breakdown? Or was the miracle of Ella's blessing and return simply one of the Lord's many ways of strengthening our faith in immortality and in enlightening our minds regarding his own mighty power? These matters aside, it is difficult to imagine how any rational, objective person can contemplate this remarkable account without feeling greater hope in the life to come, and a stronger conviction that death is truly a new beginning rather than an occasion for despair and endless mourning. Surely the Ella Jensen story is a marvelous one. Nevertheless, as we have already stressed, it is but one of countless others inside the church and out. A Gallup poll, in fact, indicates that approximately 8 million adults in America alone have undergone experiences of this general nature. Over the past several years, in fact, many books have been published on the subject. Four of them especially have gained much recognition and exerted significant impact upon our society. As previously mentioned, three of these works were authored by Raymond A. Moody, a Ph.D. in philosophy, who is also an M.D. and psychiatrist. The fourth was written by George G. Ritchie, M.D. and psychiatrist, and will be referred to later. Dr. Moody's first work on this subject was published in 1975 and has sold millions of copies. Entitled Life After Life, the book involves studies of and interviews with 150 people who had undergone what Moody calls the near-death experience, abbreviated NDE. Dr. Moody uses the term near-death experience because he defines death as a condition wherein the spirit not only leaves the body but fails to return. The spirit, in simpler terms, must stay put outside the body. In most of the cases he studied, however, his subjects had definitely died, medically speaking, having no heartbeat, respiration, or evidence of brain activity. And according to their own accounts, their spirits had withdrawn 
from their physical bodies, returning a short while later, often because of medical resuscitation, to reactivate the heart. All of these individuals reported fascinating, highly enlightening experiences during their period of separation, and the life-after-life work that resulted opened as never before the way for study in that connection. People who had previously been reluctant to talk about such matters for fear of being ridiculed as weird, perhaps even considered insane, now became willing to discuss them. Relatedly, doctors, psychologists, and other professionals began to examine such claims more open-mindedly and subject them to objective analysis. This book was followed two years later by Moody's Reflections on Life After Life, which seeks, as the title suggests, to analyze his first work and also answers various questions asked by some of those who read it. This second publication, though less popular and perhaps significant than the first, is nevertheless well worth reading. More recently, in August of 1988, Dr. Moody published The Light Beyond, confirming and extending his earlier efforts and derived in large measure from personal interviews with more than 1,000 people who had undergone near-death experiences. Such individuals, as in his earlier study, report what it is like to die, withdraw from their bodies as spirits, and undergo the same basic kinds of experiences reported earlier. Initially, for example, the spirit withdraws from the body and lingers briefly, usually hovers there a short distance off at a slight elevation. If death occurs inside a home or hospital room, the spirit frequently drifts toward the ceiling, temporarily gazing back on those who remain, family members, doctors and nurses or others. Almost invariably, the spirit, looking back, promptly begins to wonder, in effect, why all the fuss? Why the frantic efforts to revive me, the sorrow, the lamentation? After all, I still exist, and this new experience isn't really bad at all. It is, in fact, quite enjoyable, indeed marvelous. This is the end of Side 1. Please continue listening on Side 2. Eventually, although it doesn't always happen in exactly the same way, the deceased then pass through a dark tunnel with a light at the end. Upon emerging, they are usually greeted by loved ones in joyous reunion, and shortly afterward, sometimes immediately, have an even more remarkable encounter with a divine personage, often identified as a being of light. This being of light is considered by many of those who meet him to be Jesus Christ himself, and usually asks various questions, never in a harsh or judgmental manner, but rather in a spirit of kind and loving inquiry. For example, how did you spend your time in mortality? What did you learn? Many people also tell of undergoing a kind of instantaneous life review in which the events of their existence are even reenacted somewhat, as though one were seeing a video. In the life review, however, the individual involved is actually able to feel the impact of his words and actions upon others for good or for evil. If he is dealt harshly or cruelly with someone, he can feel the sorrow and suffering. The reverse, of course, is true if he has treated them with love and with kindness. That marvelous review not only generates empathy, but also a heightened sense of responsibility. The sometimes painful yet healthy realization that I am accountable for my acts, that the buck stops here, Fortunately, the sense of responsibility persists once the spirit has returned to the body. Almost invariably, however, the return is highly reluctant. The new spirit realm and the associations are simply so good, so fulfilling, that the person who has arrived there is loath to depart. One man even became highly vexed at a doctor colleague who brought him back to mortality through electroshock and upon having to re-enter his body exclaimed, Carl! Don't you ever do a thing like that again. In many instances, the dear departed appear to have no choice in the matter and are at the command of those working upon their bodies as though the connective strands between mortality and the next dimension haven't been fully severed. Sometimes, on the other hand, it becomes a definite personal decision, as in the case, for example, of the mother who has left young children behind and feels the need to be with them. 
In some instances, those who have left their bodies for longer periods report having fairly extended visits with their beloved family members who have gone beyond, quite often in delightful pastoral surroundings, lovely meadows and woodlands, much it would seem like those scenes described in the writings of J.R. Tolkien. In rarer instances, the person who has just died doesn't pass through a tunnel at all, but finds himself hurtling off into the heavens in the twinkling of an eye, as it were. Many, in fact, report having moved from one place to another, wherever they may be situated on the other side, with that same kind of rapidity, perhaps the speed of light. That alone would probably be so fascinating and downright exhilarating that one might never want to return to the comparatively slow, ponderous existence of mortality. Whatever the precise experience on the other side, those who return have acquired a new lease on life in more ways than one. Even though they have returned reluctantly, once they have adjusted to earthly living, they approach it with great enthusiasm. They now see life in much broader context and are able to extract the gold from the dross more discerningly, the consequential from the trivial. They seem to be at peace with themselves and with others, yet also highly enthusiastic, eager to make the most of whatever time remains. As people who no longer fear death, they are better able to embrace life. Invariably, according to Dr. Moody, that holds true for everyone, including the thousand-plus people he has interviewed. In my 20 years of intense exposure to NDEers, he states, I have yet to find one who hasn't had a very deep and positive transformation as a result of this experience. Relatedly, all emerge from their sojourn in the next realm with the conviction that loving and learning are the two greatest elements of life. Indeed, love and learning combine to foster all the remaining great and godly virtues, such as faith, humility, generosity, courage, compassion, and so on. These NDEers now find the process of living a purposeful life far simpler. Unlike many other traumatic experiences, such as terrible accidents and disastrous losses, victimization and abuse, and so on, which leave most people emotionally devastated, the NDE almost always liberates and strengthens. This is true in many cases, even for suicides and criminals. The former return convinced that life has a purpose and that suicide is essentially simply a premature change of address. The latter see as never before the folly of their ways and resolve to reform. Once NDE years have returned and readjusted to earthly living, they seem eager to live out their remaining time on earth, not because they fear death, for that fear has been vanquished, but rather because they now realize that the life here is a highly significant phase of the whole eternal scheme and that it should be experienced to the full. As Moody explains, endy ears return with a sense that everything is connected. This is difficult for them to define, but it is a newfound respect for nature and the world around them. He then illustrates with this moving comment from an endy ear who had suffered cardiac arrest at age 62. The first thing I saw when I awoke in the hospital was a flower, and I cried. Believe it or not, I had never really seen a flower until I came back from death. One big thing I learned when I died was that we are all a part of one big divine universe. If we think we can hurt another person or another living thing without hurting ourselves, we are sadly mistaken. I look at a forest or a flower or a bird now and say, that is me, part of me. We are connected with all things, and if we send love along those connections, then we are happy. Despite the ever-expanding evidence supporting the reality of near-death experiences, however, there are still plenty of skeptics who try to explain them on some other basis. Indeed, there are some in the medical profession, for example, who maintain that they have never encountered such things. Moody illustrates here by telling of a meeting he attended in which a doctor stood up and stated that during all his years of practice, he had never met anyone who claimed to have had an NDE. Immediately after he sat down, however, someone else stood up and said, 
Doctor, I am one of them, and I am also one of your patients. But you are the last one I would ever share such an experience with. It is entirely possible, in other words, that those professionals who haven't heard of such things have either never inquired or have the kind of negative attitude that would turn NDEers off, make them feel as though they were casting their pearls before swine. Some people attempt to explain away such experiences by labeling them vivid dreams, delirium, hallucinations, and so forth. This despite the fact that there is usually no evidence whatever of brain activity or other signs of life in the individual claiming the NDE, as we have said. In addition, Dr. Moody and other experts who have taken the trouble to interview NDEers and carefully analyze their accounts insist that what happened simply cannot be explained away. In answers to those who maintain that the NDE is simply a form of mental illness, Moody replies that there is no more resemblance between the two than there is between a lamb and a lion. He then contrasts such mental disturbances as schizophrenia and organic brain problems like delirium with the NDE, demonstrating highly significant differences. Schizophrenia, for example, usually involves the hearing of strange voices, bizarre mannerisms, and loose, meaningless words and phrases called neologisms, along with worsening apathy. Right away, he says, you can see the difference between this terrible mental illness and the generally uplifting near-death experience. He then adds that although NDEers often hear words during their otherworldly experience, they are coherent and meaningful, uplifting, rather than psychologically destructive. As Moody also notes, although NDEers often claim to have encountered a being of light, they do not come away from the experience supposing that they are Napoleon or God because of it. Other attempts to explain away the NDE include the contention that it is simply a reenactment of the birth experience, a result of carbon dioxide overload, the mind's final instinctive efforts to deny that death is the end, or the manifestation of the so-called collective unconscious. None of these explanations holds up, however, under careful examination. All efforts to explain near-death experiences away, in fact, inevitably run into the same big problem. None have an answer for the remarkable ability of many NDEers to observe and report things occurring in connection with their own bodies once there is no longer any clinical evidence of life. How is it that patients can give such elaborate and detailed accounts of resuscitations, Moody inquires, explaining in their entirety what the doctors were doing to bring them back to life. How can so many people explain what was going on in other rooms of the hospital while their bodies were in the operating room being resuscitated? Moody cites in this regard the case of a man who had suffered such a severe heart attack that after 35 minutes of vigorous resuscitation, the doctor gave up and began filling out the death certificate. Then someone noticed faint signs of life, so the doctor resumed his efforts and finally managed to restart the patient's heart. The next day... That same patient described in detail what had transpired in the emergency room during the time he was gone from his body. He even described the emergency room nurse right down to her wedge hairdo and her last name, Hawks, along with the kind of resuscitation equipment that she was transporting to his room. Journeying down the hospital hallway to find his wife, he, quote, passed right through Nurse Hawks. He read the name tag as he went through her and remembered it so he could thank her later, unquote. All this to the utter amazement of the doctor who, Moody adds, was quite rattled by it all. In another case, again to the astonishment of all involved, a woman of 70, blind since age 18, gave a vivid account of what the resuscitation instruments looked like, including the colors. Most of those instruments, in fact, had not even been thought of 50 years earlier when she could see. In still another case, a man and his sister were both critically ill simultaneously in different wards of the same hospital, the man with heart failure, the woman in a diabetic coma. Both died and passed into the spirit world at approximately the same time. After a brief visit together there, the man returned to this life, leaving his sister in the spirit world. Upon re-entering his body, 
he informed the doctor that his sister was now dead on the other side. Skeptical doctor denied such a possibility, but checked with the other ward and was nonplussed upon hearing the truth. Moody refers in The Light Beyond to other prominent doctors, psychiatrists and philosophers who support his conclusions, some of whom undertook studies of the near-death experience after reading his works on the subject. Ritchie, like Moody, is an M.D. and psychiatrist. His story begins during World War II when he was afflicted with a devastating case of pneumonia as a callow and materially-minded recruit at Camp Barkley in Texas. It describes in fascinating detail his flight from his body homeward and return halfway there for an encounter with a magnificent being announced as the Son of God himself. It details at length his tour of the spirit realms with that same personage. At one point, he encounters beings who have been so enslaved to negative thinking and destructive habits on earth that they are unable to escape them in the next life. Not, he stresses, that the Savior had abandoned them, but rather that they had abandoned him, creating their own unique kind of hell. He describes as well vast institutions of learning containing the great works of the universe, where spirits of the deceased are happily engrossed in an eternity of learning. Ironically, however, they have become so absorbed in books per se that they fail to discern the greater light, the mighty truth himself, standing there in the very midst of them. He also tells of a glorious city of light glowing in the immense distances, wondrous and enthralling, but beyond his present reach. Like many others, Ritchie was asked what he had learned and done with his life, not, as he explains, because the Son of God was seeking information, for his entire life was there in plain sight, implicit, he says, in every scene. Furthermore, it seemed to be a question, in Ritchie's view, that was more about values than facts. Desperately, he began to search his mind for something that might reflect well, but could only recall a, quote, endless, short-sighted, clamorous concern for myself, unquote. Even his most prized achievement, that of becoming an Eagle Scout, he now realized had been largely an ego trip. His aspirations to become a medical doctor with the avowed intention of serving others, he also realized had been largely motivated by a desire for material belongings, a Cadillac, private plane, and so on. For a time, he sought to excuse himself on grounds that he simply hadn't lived long enough to learn and do what was right, only to be lovingly reminded that death can arrive at any age. Momentarily, Ritchie thought about the insurance policy he had taken out previously, not so much with the idea that his beneficiaries might collect upon it, as with the subconscious conviction, quote, that this piece of paper might somehow guarantee life itself. Unquote. Simultaneously, he began to realize that the presence beside him was emanating a sense of mirth, quote, that he seemed to vibrate and shimmer with a kind of holy laughter, not at me and my silliness, not a mocking laughter, but a mirth that seemed to say that in spite of all error and tragedy, joy was more lasting still, unquote. Above all, Throughout the entire experience, the feeling and importance of love seemed to predominate. How much, Richie wondered, had he really loved? Have you loved others as I am loving you? The words came. Totally? Unconditionally? Realizing how far he fell short, Richie groped for some excuse, indignantly demanding that if love was, quote, the point of everything, why hadn't someone told me? Unquote. Again, he felt that hint of heavenly laughter, free of all rebuke, merely great warmth and understanding, along with the following reply. I did tell you. I told you by the life I lived. I told you by the death I died. And if you keep your eyes on me, you will see more. Following his return... Ritchie astounded his medical doctors, including the hospital's commanding officer, Dr. Donald G. Francie, who termed his recovery, quote, the most amazing medical case I have ever encountered. 
In a notarized statement a year later, in fact, he wrote, Private George S. Ritchie's virtual call from death and return to vigorous health has to be explained in terms other than natural means. Unquote. Like nearly all NDEers, Ritchie found that his life had undergone dramatic reorientation. Nevertheless, the years ahead were not easy. Arriving late for his entry into medical school and still recuperating from his illness, he found it impossible to catch up and study the long hours required. In consequence, he was expelled from school and reclassified for active duty as a medic overseas. This proved to be the unhappiest experience of his life, and for a time he wondered bitterly why he had ever undergone his marvelous experience in the spirit realm. In time, however, he became inspired by the great love and spirit of Christ-like sacrifice manifest in some of his own comrades. Consequently, he began to see the Savior in the eyes of those around him who were giving their all to save the lives of others. From that time forward, his own life began to improve. Eventually, despite his earlier failure, he went on to become a doctor. He also lectured widely on his experiences in the spirit world, spreading, quote, the message that God is love and that all else is hell, unquote. George F. Ritchie continued to advance his message about the reality of a life to come and of Jesus Christ, despite a conviction that many people would brand him a religious fanatic and that such pursuits might ruin him professionally. When, in fact, he applied for his residency in psychiatry at the University of Virginia Hospital, a friend advised him not to mention his experiences in the next realm. The first question posed during his job interview, however, dealt with that very subject, and Ritchie turned to his Savior for help. Lord, what do I say now? He prayed. The reply came immediately and unequivocally. Deny me before men, and I will deny you before my Father. Those words, he reports, had been almost inaudible. But Ritchie responded to the question his interviewers asked frankly. A short time later, to his great delight and surprise, he was accepted unanimously by the examining staff. Years afterward, when he and the same interviewer had become close friends, Ritchie learned that everyone on the examining board had known of his claims about the other world. If you had pretended with me even for one moment that it hadn't happened, he was informed, I'd have put you down as a deeply insecure person and probably an an emotionally disturbed one who couldn't distinguish between fact and fancy. Such in brief is the message of Dr. George A. Ritchie's popular Return from Tomorrow. It is a work, in my estimation, that should be read by everyone and concludes with the following inspirational message. God is busy building a race of men who know how to love. I believe that the fate of the earth itself depends on the progress we make and that the time is now very short. As for what we will find in the next world, here too I believe that what we'll discover there depends on how well we get on with the business of loving here and now. Raymond Moody and George Ritchie are both well aware of LDS teachings regarding the next life, and both have lectured before Mormon gatherings. Furthermore, despite his insistence that religion is not a factor in the near-death experience, Moody makes the following observation in The Light Beyond. There are many religions around the world that readily accept NDEs as the doorway to the spiritual world. The most prominent of the Western religions to do this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormon Church. He then refers to the Journal of Discourses, observing that Mormons believe strongly in a life beyond wherein the Spirit has, quote, greatly enhanced capacities, unquote, including the ability to consider many different ideas simultaneously, move with lightning speed, see in many directions at once, communicate in a variety of ways, and be free from pain and illness. In this connection, he quotes a prominent church authority as follows, We shall turn around and look upon it 
the valley of death, and think when we have crossed it, why, this is the greatest advantage of my whole existence. For I have passed from a state of sorrow, grief, mourning, woe, misery, pain, anguish, and disappointment into a stage of existence where I can enjoy life to the fullest extent as far as that can be done without the body. Moody also observes that Mormons undergo essentially the same experiences during their visits to the spirit world that other people do, and quotes a well-known example from the life of Jedediah Grant, as related by Heber C. Kimball. He said to me, Brother Grant, I have been into the spirit world two nights in succession, and of all the dreads that ever came across me, the worst was to have to return to my body, though I had to do it. As Moody points out, Brother Grant's dread resulted from an encounter with his deceased wife and daughter during that period on the other side, and his reluctance to leave them for mortality. He saw his wife. She was the first person that came to him. He saw many that he knew, but he did not have a conversation with any but his wife, Caroline. She came to him, and he said she looked beautiful and had their little child that had died on the plains in her arms and said, Mr. Grant, here is little Margaret. You know that the wolves ate her up, but it did not hurt her. Here she is all right. With all due respect, however, it is doubtful whether either Doctors Moody or Ritchie are fully aware of the remarkable prevalence of near-death experiences among members of the Mormon faith, or how detailed many of them are. Nor is it likely that any non-member, no matter how open-minded or well-informed, can fully appreciate or comprehend their ultimate ramifications in terms of that grand eternal program known as the plan of salvation. In reality, for that matter, none of us can for it is eternal, unending, and here in mortality we all see through a glass darkly. As one who has written and lectured extensively over many years on the LDS view of immortality in any case, I can strongly affirm the kinds of experiences Drs. Moody and Ritchie have discussed and shared. I have rarely, if ever, spoken upon the life to come, in fact, without encountering at least one person afterward who has either had direct contact with the spirit world via the NDE or some other channel, or knows someone who has. Although I personally have never undergone an NDE, some of my close friends and relatives have been there. One fine lady I know, a relative through marriage, recently related her own experiences in the spirit world during a family gathering in my home. While suffering a serious illness, she passed into the spirit world and spent time, among other things, with a young daughter whom she had lost some years earlier. There, on the other side, she was also allowed to visit several of our temples. At present, she does not fully comprehend why, but has the strong impression that our temples are also spiritual centers relating to the NDE in some way. The accounts in my own case have been coming fairly steadily for a long time, so many now that some have been forgotten, or the details have become hazy. Others remain vivid. Several years ago, for example, a student in one of my writing classes at Weber State University submitted her own experiences in the spirit world to fulfill an assignment on the personal narrative. Living alone in a mobile home on the outskirts of town, she had at one time been asphyxiated during her slumbers because of a faulty heating system. In the morning, she was discovered apparently comatose and rushed to the hospital. There, fortunately, she was revived and has since led an active, productive life, excelling in many hobbies and teaching in a local high school. During the night of her mishap, however, her spirit had passed from her body into the next realm to visit rather lengthily with loved ones, including in particular her deceased parents. Like many others, she found herself amid beautiful pastoral surroundings, flower-filled meadows, and verdant woodlands. Her parents were dwelling in a pleasant cottage of the kind one might find in parts of rural England. She longed passionately to remain there with them forever. To her great dismay, however, she was lovingly informed that her time in mortality had not run its course. Shortly afterward, even as she reached out for a final longing embrace, she was drawn 
inexorably to her physical body in the hospital. Not long ago, while serving as president of the Ogden, Utah State Mission, I paid several visits in the company of a full-time elder from Salt Lake City to the home of a man who had spent much of his adult life in prison. Though formerly a tough and hardened felon, this man had a lot of charisma, was well-versed in the Bible, and now seemed to be reaching out to some extent for things spiritual. During one conversation, he informed us that he had nearly died a violent death three different times. On the final occasion, he had been stabbed by another prisoner, actually passed into the beyond for a brief visit with his grandmother, who was clad in a white gown and gold slippers. He then returned to his body, lying there on the prison floor in its own blood. Needless to say, his return was not a happy one, and at the time of our discussion, he was living alone in a shabby one-room apartment, suffering from a degenerative hip disease that made walking painful and difficult. Nevertheless, his brief sojourn in the spirit world seemed to have given him a more positive outlook and greater desire to avoid past mistakes. Recently, my wife Sharon and I were visited by a convert to the church who had earlier served with me as a missionary in our stake. Now a dedicated social worker, he had been wounded in Vietnam and nearly died there. More recently, during surgery for severe pulmonary edema, he had died and passed into the next realm. His visit was brief, and for some reason he could not see much, either in that world or the present. Only by a specific act of will, as he reflected upon his poor dear wife, a phrase that returned to him several times when he pondered her bereavement, could he look back and actually see her there, in his hospital room. Nearby him in the spirit world was a benign presence, though again he could not see who it was, merely sense the almost palpable emanations from a divine and radiant personality. Then he was hearing words from mortality, words of blessing. Two doctors, both members of the LDS Church, had been summoned and were administering to him, or rather to his inert body there on the operating table. Now he could hear the blessing clearly and again see into mortality, enough at least to view their backs and bowed heads as they performed the holy ordinance. Ere long he had returned to his body and was undergoing the violent trauma of electroshock resuscitation, feeling his body jerk and spasm almost as though he might tear apart. He related this experience while visiting in our home, standing all the while, pacing about occasionally for more than an hour. His entire deportment conveyed a humble, genuine desire to relate an extraordinary yet eminently real experience, but also frequent frustration in attempting to describe it. But I can tell you this, he concluded, all that happened to me over there, especially my right to return to this life, was somehow determined by that special being so close by on the other side. And as mentioned, in my introduction, we have the young women's president from Idaho who related five such accounts, including her own death and return during delivery of her seventh child. Sometimes the spirit returns to its mortal body very briefly to perform a particular act or complete some mission. Recently, following a talk I had delivered on immortality at a sacrament meeting, a member of that ward told me of his own near-death experience. He then referred to one of his relatives in Bountiful, Utah, who had died of cancer. Shortly afterward, however, apparently within the same hour, he returned to life for a few days, long enough to give his wife and children blessings. Then he passed on again into the spirit world for good. Some years ago, my father-in-law, Louis J. Wallace, died of cancer, having waged a valiant battle and set an inspiring example of faith and courage for his loved ones and friends. His wife was away from his bedside at the time of his passing, attending to something in the basement. When she returned, he was gone, though not quite. Minutes later, his spirit re-entered his body for only a few moments. His eyes never opened, but a tear rolled from one of them, and as his wife bent over to embrace him, he murmured three of the most wonderful, magical words a person can ever hear. 
I love you. Then he was gone. He had simply, in my opinion, by the sheer force of his remarkable will, returned for those brief moments to bid his beloved wife goodbye. Family members have sometimes suggested, partly in fond jest, but also with some conviction, that as a respected lawyer, he knew his full rights and took full advantage of them. A classic and impressive example in this category of temporary return is related by President Spencer W. Kimball in his excellent little booklet, Tragedy or Destiny. The account involves one of his uncles and occurred in November 1881. My uncle, David Patton Kimball, left his home in Arizona on a trip across the Salt River Desert. He fixed up his books, settled accounts, and told his wife of a premonition that he would not return. He was lost on the desert for two days and three nights, suffering untold agonies of thirst and pain. He passed into the spirit world and described later in a letter of January 8, 1882, to his sister what had happened there. He had seen his parents. My father, he said, told me I could remain there if I chose to do so, but I pleaded with him that I might stay with my family long enough to make them comfortable, to repent of my sins, and more fully prepare myself for the change. Had it not been for this, I never should have returned home except as a corpse. Father finally told me I could remain two years and do all the good I could during that time, after which he would come for me. He also mentioned four others that he would come for as well. Unquote. Two years to the day from that experience on the desert, he died easily and apparently without any pain. Shortly before he died, he looked up and called, Father, Father. Within approximately a year of his death, the other four men named were also gone. At times, of course, spirits return to the veil with no attempt to re-enter their mortal bodies, in some cases long after their corpses have moldered away in the earth. Such was the case with Ella Jensen's Uncle Hans, who may have returned to mortality at least three times, as pointed out earlier, once to notify his mother of his passing, later to advise and comfort his brother there on the Snake River in Idaho, and finally during his visit to Ella herself when he summoned her to the other side. Moody's works, incidentally, do not involve experiences of this nature, perhaps because they are generally more difficult to verify. Such things, however, appear to occur frequently among people of all faiths, and again, as might be supposed, are very common among Mormons. Once after speaking at a fireside in North Ogden on my favorite subject, yes, immortality, I was about to leave while members of the gathering were still enjoying some refreshments in the kitchen. The only person remaining in the living room where I had just spoken was a man I knew seated beside the front door. Looks as if I won't be adding to my accounts this time, I said. Spoil my perfect record. No, you won't, he replied and gave me a friendly grin. He then told me about the passing of his father a few years earlier and said that his mother was not only saddened over the loss but highly upset about having to arrange for the funeral. Above all, she was concerned about whom she would ask to speak. After a day or so, however, the problem was resolved. As she explained to her son, your father visited me during the night and said not to worry. He outlined the entire program and told me who he wanted as speakers. One of those speakers, incidentally, was the wife herself. One of my wife's close relatives was once visited several times during the night by her deceased sister-in-law. For some reason, though, the sister-in-law seemed unable to speak. She merely appeared by the bedside, and the relative in question became rather agitated, fearing that perhaps her time on earth was up. In the morning, though, she related what had happened to her husband, who phoned her later from his office to report that he knew the answer. The thought had just struck him with great force that his dead sister wanted to have her temple work performed. Sometime before her death, she had become unhappy over a misunderstanding with her ward bishop and left the church. By now, her brother felt certain she wanted to return. Her visit to his wife that previous night, in fact, had occurred exactly one year following her death. 
the waiting period required before one who is passed on can have such work performed. Her brother had not realized that fact until the awareness hit home that morning in his office and prompted him to check the date. A close acquaintance of mine, prominent both in church and community, once told me of a similar visit while he and his wife were nearing the end of their mission in Nigeria. Having arisen early in the morning to write in his journal, he was visited by the spirit of a neighbor who had died some years before. The neighbor earnestly requested that my friend visit his wife upon his return from Africa and urge her to have their temple work performed. His wife had now remarried, and he was clearly concerned that he might lose her to another man forever. My friend complied with the request, but when I last inquired, the wife had failed to take the desired action, an experience, perhaps, with an important lesson. An elderly man from my ward, now gone to the spirit world himself, once told my wife and me of a fascinating experience he and his brother had undergone regarding spiritual visitation. Years earlier, these two men had fallen into a heated disagreement over property rights. The dispute had become so bitter they had ceased speaking to each other even though they lived only a short distance apart. Then one night, something occurred that changed the situation dramatically. The man relating this story was visited by the spirit of his deceased father who said, in effect, I am sick and tired of all this foolishness. If you two boys don't shape up and start treating each other right, I'll take both of you to the other side right now. The man in question took his father's warning to heart promptly, saddled up his horse, and headed off into the middle of the night for his brother's home. Partway there, he met his brother, coming top speed the opposite direction via horse and buggy. There in the middle of that dark night on a lonely country road, those two estranged brothers reined to a halt, leapt down, and embraced each other. Only then did they discover that their deceased father had visited each of them only moments apart, and issued the same warning. A short time ago, I visited a woman, age 70, in our ward while home teaching. Her husband, a member of my high priest's quorum, had died two weeks before, after much travail. Needless to say, she was feeling a profound loss. During our conversation, however, she mentioned almost casually that her husband had returned to visit and comfort her one night a week earlier. He really looked happy and peaceful, she said, and he also looked lots younger, about 30 years old. He was wearing a robe that, well, it wasn't exactly white. It was sort of cream-colored. Her husband, in turn, had been visited while on his hospital deathbed by his deceased mother. She was wearing a brightly flowered dress and had apparently come for him. Upon hearing such accounts, I must reiterate I am invariably impressed by their simplicity and naturalness. Always those relating them are rational and modest, never given, as far as I can ascertain, to exaggeration or sensationalism. They merely relate what they experienced in simple, matter-of-fact fashion. For them, what occurred is so real, they never feel a need to argue the matter. It simply happened. This is the end of Side 2. Please continue listening on Side 3. The works analyzed thus far are perhaps the most significant in their field. Raised from the dead, because of the many credible witnesses, and the fact that it literally involved a return from the dead at the hands of a modern prophet by the power of the priesthood, the light beyond and other works of Raymond Moody, because they have generated such widespread interest in near-death experiences and have lent them so much credibility. Return from tomorrow, because it is perhaps the most fascinating and detailed single account ever published on the subject. Another account of great significance, but now virtually lost to history, is William Dudley Paley's Seven Minutes in Eternity, The Amazing Experience That Made Me Over, published in the American Magazine, March 1929. The same story was also published in the Improvement Era, forerunner of the LDS Ensign, that year in its June and July issues, and introduced with the following editorial advice. This 
startling story by William Dudley Paley should be read by everyone. The editor's comment in the American magazine was more detailed. Not long ago, he says, William Dudley Paley came into the office of the American magazine after an absence of more than a year. Man, what's happened to you? asked the editor. You're looking incredibly better than you did the last time I saw you. You've never seen me before, replied Mr. Paley. I mean that the fellow who is standing before you now is a new Bill Paley, so new that he's only about one year old. I've had an experience. On the strength of that conversation, Mr. Paley was asked to write about his great adventure. Neither the editor nor any members of the staff knew what transforming experience the author had been through, but it was evident to all that he had greatly changed, both in appearance and in manner. The accompanying article is the intimate account of his rebirth. It will surprise and interest you as much as it surprised and interested the staff of the American magazine. Paley's fascinating experience in the next realm occurred in April 1928, while he was writing a novel at a secluded mountain retreat in the Sierra Madres near Pasadena, California. Paley was there alone, accompanied only by his police dog, Laska. Having completed his writing for the day, he retired to bed and lay reading until midnight or later. Eventually, he put his book aside and turned out the light, falling asleep. Paley prefaces what happened next by explaining that he cannot recall having dreamed anything, that he rarely drank and had no liquor on the premises. At some time between 3 and 4 a.m., he relates, a ghastly inner shriek seemed to tear through my somnolent consciousness. In despairing horror, I wailed to myself, I'm dying, I'm dying. He staunchly maintains that what happened was not a dream, but rather, quote, a physical sensation which I can best describe as a combination of heart attack and apoplexy, unquote. Moments later, he found himself hurtling through space with one predominating thought. So this is death. Simultaneously, he found himself reflecting objectively about the body he had left behind and wondering how long it might take for anyone to discover it. Then he was whirling madly, much like an airplane passenger in a tailspin, only to have someone reach out at the last moment and catch him. A calm, clear, friendly voice said, close to my ear, Take it easy, old man. Don't be alarmed. You're all right. We're here to help you. Simultaneously, he was gently being lain out to relax on what appeared to be a beautiful marble slab pallet by pleasant and kindly young men in white uniforms who looked like hospital interns and seemed secretly amused over his confusion. Feeling better? One of them asked. Yes, came the reply. Where am I? The two young men merely exchanged good-humored glances and Paley realized that no reply was necessary, that he had indeed left his body and passed into the spirit realm. I had gone through the sensations of dying, and whether this was the hereafter or an intermediate station, most emphatically, I had reached a place and state which had never been duplicated in all my experience. He now found himself in a pleasant, beautiful environment that, despite his talents as a writer, defied complete description. Nevertheless, he offers us the following helpful picture. A sort of marble tiled and furnished portico, lighted by soft, unseen opal illumination, with a clear as crystal Roman pool diagonally across from the bench on which I remained for a time, striving to credit that all this was real. Out beyond the portico, everything appeared to exist in a sort of turquoise haze. Initially, the only people Paley had encountered were those two young men, both of them vital, glowing, and congenial individuals he somehow felt well acquainted with, yet couldn't quite identify. Then other people began to appear, many of them passing by, casting curiously amused glances, but also nodding and speaking with a kindness and friendliness that nearly overwhelmed him. As Paley explains, 
Think of all the saintly, attractive, magnetic folk you know. Imagine them constituting the whole social world. No misfits, no tense countenances, no sour leers, no preoccupied brusqueness or physical handicap, and the whole environment of life permeated with an ecstatic harmony as universal as air. And you get an idea of my reflexes in those moments. And again, as with his first two acquaintances, Paley was convinced that he had known them all before, personally, intimately. Now, however, they were physically glorified beyond anything he had known in mortality. He elaborates as follows. I pledge my reputation that I talked with these people, identified many of them, called the others by their wrong names and was corrected, saw and did things that night almost a year ago that it is verboten for me to narrate in a magazine article, but which I recall with a minuteness of detail as graphic as the keys of my typewriter. Shortly thereafter, wandering alone for the moment, he was caught up in a swirl of bluish vapor and carried away. Then he was sitting up in bed, wide awake, having returned to his physical body and feeling a great sense of exhaustion. Immediately, he cried aloud the words, That was not a dream, awakening his dog with a start. During the remainder of the night, he suffered, quote, an awful lamentation in my heart, unquote over the fact that he had been forced to return to the mortal world with its many struggles and vicissitudes, indeed, initially considered it a tragedy. Exactly where he had been, Paley seems uncertain, but it was unquestionably something beyond this mortal realm. Call it the hereafter, he says, call it heaven, call it purgatory, call it the astral plane, call it the fourth dimension, call it what you will. Whatever it is, and where, that human entities go after being released from physical limitations, I had gone there that night. And, like Lazarus of old, I had been called back, back to the anguish, in comparison, of physical existence, to finish out my time in the conventional manner. While writing the article in question a year later, Paley maintained that he had not undergone the slightest repetition of that memorable experience, was convinced without question that it was not a dream or hallucination. There is a survival of human entity after the death of the body, he assures us. For I have seen and talked intelligently with friends whom I had looked down upon as cold wax in their caskets. Our author then takes us back to the time of his boyhood, as the son of an itinerant preacher and states that his young life was surfeited with such doctrines as predestination, infant damnation, and hellfire. These things combined with forced attendance and numerous church meetings and rigorous parental discipline left him disillusioned with religion and highly cynical. As a result, he eventually became, quote, a smoldering young Bolshevik against every kind of authority, particularly against religious authority, which had apparently sanctioned these injustices against me, unquote. By age 22, he was publishing a magazine of, quote, heretical leanings and had proceeded to make things hot for several godly people whose only indictment was that they represented authority, as aforesaid, and especially spiritual, unquote. Paley's iconoclasm, however, brought only superficial satisfaction, Business projects failed, his marriage ended in early divorce, and he lost his first daughter in her childhood. He became increasingly bitter, cynical, and caustic, and relates that the only so-called friends whom he considered trustworthy could be counted on one hand, Riley adding, and most of them could bear watching. By his own admission, Paley developed an uncanny facility for antagonizing those whose help he needed most. He had become the classic misanthrope, convinced that, quote, we got nothing in this world unless we fought for it with the ferocity of a Siberian wolf dog, and that without a doubt, death ended everything, unquote. At times, he sought to correct his outlook and still find some kind of religious or spiritual answer to his problem, also reading deeply within the realms of psychology and related fields, 
but found no solutions. I was a walking exposition, he relates, of how a man may reach middle life and be the worst internal mess that ever got into who's who. That all began to change, following his experience with the other side, however. During the next few days, he went about his cabin in a near trance, feeling increasingly that he had acquired something from that other plane of existence that was working within him like yeast. Then came a second experience, not in this case a return to the other side, but rather a visitation from it. One night, still strongly imbued with feelings from his remarkable adventure, he started reading from the writings of Emerson on the Oversoul. In the process, he began to undergo a strange sensation, as though a pure white light were pouring down from above right into his skull, and suddenly a wonderful sense of peace seemed to be settling all about him. His book fell from his hands, and he sat staring into space. I was not, he asserts, the same man I had been before. In addition, there were distinct presences there in the darkening room, plainly manifest, though invisible to the mortal eye. The presences were, in fact, so real that his dog, Laskus, sat up, cocked her head from side to side, and began wagging her tail at someone standing beside his desk at one end of the room. During his entire life, Paley had never seen a ghost or had more than an academic interest in psychic phenomena. Nor had he invited his remarkable experiences as far as he knew. They had simply come to him. He amplifies as follows. What really had happened was, I had unlocked hidden powers within myself that I know every human being possesses and had augmented my five physical senses with other senses just as bona fide, legitimate, and natural as touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. That I had help in unlocking those hidden powers I do not deny. Nevertheless, nothing had happened to me that has not happened to hundreds of other people, but only very rarely do they talk about it. Paley's experiences had suddenly assured him that there is far more to life than most people imagine, that, quote, it was not the ordinary humdrum three meals a day thing that he had always imagined. Quote, its essence or its meaning is so vast and fine and high and beautiful that it overwhelmed me, and a recognition of it performed a sort of recreation in me that made me feel I was actually not the same fellow I had been just before, unquote. One of the first and most dramatic changes in the man William Dudley Paley was a physical one. Since childhood, he had lived under constant tension that kept him skinny, put an edge in his voice, and early in adulthood placed lines in his face. Attacks of indigestion were so common, he simply took them for granted. Now, suddenly, he had lost his nerves and was beginning to feel a great sense of peace and calm. Paley had been a heavy smoker throughout his adult life, and one day in his office he was preparing to light up a cigarette when, in his words, I heard a voice say, as gently as any worried mother might caution a careless son, Oh, Bill, give up your cigarettes. And even before it had occurred to me that no one was present in the flesh to address me, thus audibly I answered, All right and tossed the package into the nearby wastebasket. Paley went the entire day without smoking, but the next morning, from sheer force of habit, he reached for a tin of tobacco on the desk to load up his corncob pipe. Only, he says, to have it, quote, knocked from my hands with a slap that tossed it upward in the air and deposited it bottom upward at my feet with the tobacco spilling out. No cautioning this time, but I knew. From that day forward, Paley never touched tobacco in any form, despite having smoked, in addition to his cigarettes and pipe, a dozen cigars daily, lighting one from the butt of the other. Moreover, he managed to quit without the slightest ill effect, no agonizing torture of breaking off. He merely stopped smoking without any effort or repercussion. The same thing happened with coffee, tea, alcohol, and meats. They simply cease to exist for me, he explains. And inversely, 
a strange new sensation began to manifest itself in my muscles and organs. Relatedly, he experienced a glorious sense of physical uplift. Exercise began to come both effortlessly and pleasurably, and although he had always been somewhat stoop-shouldered, his spine seemed to straighten out of its own accord. He had, in addition, become capable of withstanding fatigue, could work at his writing for twelve-hour stints, and despite having suffered from insomnia most of his life, he now slept soundly. Even more astounding was the transformation in his human relationships. Previously, as mentioned, he had few friends because of his caustic and belligerent nature. Now friends began to appear unexpectedly and in abundance. Stranger still, a number of them began offering to help him out financially and otherwise. For the first time in my experience, Paley relates, people were going out of their way to perform services for me, to counsel me, to seek my society, to make me and my problems one with themselves. Yes, even to offer me unsolicited loans. What is this thing which had happened to me? He inquires. And why did it happen? He then goes on to explain that it stemmed in part from a powerful, if subconscious, hunger for the things of the spirit. That such a hunger somehow put him in tune with spiritual forces of very high and altruistic order. And yet, Paley confesses, I can no more explain the fourth dimension with words than I can convey to a man blind from birth the redness of the color red. Or, employing another analogy, no more make it intelligible to the average reader than Einstein can explain relativity to a group of men in a smoking car, all of them unfamiliar with advanced mathematics. Nevertheless, Paley boldly contends that, quote, there is a world of subliminal or spiritual existence interpenetrating the ordinary world in which most of us exist as ordinary two-legged Americans full of aches and worries and that this subliminal world is the real world, the world of stern reality, if you will. To this he adds, it is waiting for the race to learn of it and tap its beneficent resources without waiting for what we call physical death, that our dead dear ones are existent in it, alive, happy, conscious, and waiting for us to join them, either at death or any time we reach that stage of spirituality where we can make contact with them. I have seen my own there and have visited with them. This in turn is elaborated by the following edifying commentary. There is in every human heart a hunger and thirst for the things of the spirit, but in many of them this desire has been embalmed with the poisons of worry, doubt, fleshly desire, struggle to attain the wherewithal for physical survival, that for all practical purposes it no longer exists. But the day is coming in the evolution of the race when spirituality is going to be the whole essence of life, instead of the world's present materialism. Here and there have always been those who, by their unusual visions, self-invited or otherwise, might be called monitors for the rest of us, showing us what we all may attain if we so order our lives and thinking as to be susceptible to such revelations. Examples of contact with the spirit realm, via the near-death experience or otherwise, can be multiplied endlessly for those earnestly seeking them, both within the LDS faith and the world at large. As mentioned earlier, a Gallup poll reveals that 8 million American adults, about 1 in 20, have undergone a near-death experience, excluding other forms of spirit contact of the variety just discussed. In addition, it is now clear that people of all ages, young children as well, undergo the same kind of experience. As for the church itself, I am convinced that thousands of pages could be collected on the subject with sufficient commitment. Indeed, they would continue without limit, for church membership is ever-expanding. In comparing LDS near-death experiences and other forms of spirit world contact with those of society at large, it becomes clear that they are generally quite similar. There are, however, some significant differences as well. 
Although no statistical evidence is available in this regard, it appears that such experiences are even more common among Mormons. If so, this might well result from the fact that the true church of Jesus Christ has always been intimately intertwined with life on the other side, both in terms of doctrine and its ordinances. Consider again the role of genealogical and temple work in this respect. That immense and profound program which exists above all else to extend the gospel and blessings of eternal marriage to all who are willing to qualify and accept on both sides of the veil, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Consider also the fact that belief in the life to come has always been a hallmark of Christ's church and the powerful evidence of its divinity. Such a condition, one might logically conclude, would make its members more sensitive generally to promptings from the next realm, more in tune, more consistently and meaningfully connected to it. Finally, bear in mind the role of the priesthood itself in maintaining contact with those in the next realm for guidance and for authority to act in the name of God. There is another important consideration as well, especially when it comes to the NDE. Moody and his colleagues, along with many of those they have interviewed, assure us that it matters not what denomination one belongs to on the other side, that there are definitely more important considerations. Question. How does one explain the apparent discrepancy between this view and our own that the restored gospel is all-important, regardless of whether we are dwelling upon this side of the veil or the other? I do not profess a complete answer here by any means, but perhaps the following thoughts may have some merit. To begin with, it should be remembered that nearly all the near-death experiences reported by Moody and his colleagues, even the detailed accounts by Ritchie and Paley, cover a very brief time span. Most, if not every one, appear to have lasted only a few minutes. Under such circumstances, it does not seem likely that one would become involved with denominational questions or certainly get launched on the six missionary discussions. Such concerns logically would likely require a longer adjustment period and not be hurled at an NDE or on the spur of the moment. On the other hand, consider how much the near-death experiences of the world in general correspond to some of the greatest and most fundamental truths of the restored gospel. First, of course, that we are indeed eternal, that the spirit world is very real and very near. Second, that we retain our individual identity and are privileged to mingle with friends and loved ones in joyous reunion on the other side, in the words of Brigham Young. Yes, brethren, they are there together. And if they associate together and collect together in clans and societies as they do here, it is their privilege. No doubt they yet more or less see, hear, converse, and have to do with each other both good and bad. To this, he hearteningly adds, we have more friends behind the veil than on this side, and they will hail us more joyfully than you were ever welcomed by your parents and friends in this world, and you will rejoice more when you meet them than you ever rejoiced to see a friend in this life. And then shall we go on from step to step, from rejoicing to rejoicing, and from one intelligence and power to another, our happiness becoming more and more exquisite and sensible. Third, that those who die will undergo a divine encounter upon reaching the other side, although all NDEs do not follow the same exact pattern. The frequent reports regarding encounters with a being of light who asks loving but searching questions about their life is entirely consistent with the LDS view that we undergo a, quote, partial judgment, unquote, at the time of our death. That judgment, or interview, as some refer to it, may not always be conducted in the same manner. Some people apparently experience it almost immediately upon reaching the other side. Others may have to wait until they have been there a while, hence not experience it at all during their brief sojourn beyond. Nevertheless, the divine encounter is a basic part of Mormon belief. Fourth, 
that learning is a vital, eternal process that not only continues but receives growing emphasis in the next realm. As the Lord himself assures us through the prophet Joseph Smith, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, adding that it is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance. Elaborating these truths, he also states, Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. And if a person gain more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. Fifth, that we are responsible for our own acts and decisions. Many people return from their visit to the beyond imbued as never before with a sense of personal accountability. This, too, is a fundamental tenet of Mormonism underscored in the doctrine of free agency, which was promulgated long before the earth began. Members of the church are taught that our presence here upon the earth was not only made possible by God and His Son, Jesus Christ, but that it is also the result of a personal decision based upon a keen awareness of the consequences. Former church president Spencer W. Kimball explained the matter this way. We knew before we were born that we were coming to earth for bodies and experience and that we would have joys and sorrows, ease and pain, comforts and hardships. We knew also that after a period of life that we would die. We accepted all these eventualities with a glad heart, eager to accept both the favorable and the unfavorable. We eagerly accepted the chance to come earthward, even though it might be for only a day or a year. Perhaps we were not so much concerned whether we should die of disease or accident or senility. We were willing to take life as it came and as we might organize and control it, and this without murmur, complaint, or unreasonable demands. Few statements, if any, could blend the concept of free agency and personal responsibility with an understanding of our very existence more succinctly or enlighteningly. Sixth, that love is the greatest of all godly virtues. This belief, of course, is advanced by most religions, but none teach it more emphatically than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In the words of Elder Bruce R. McConkie, Love is the foundation for peace and righteousness in this life and for salvation in the life hereafter. Faith operates by love. The saints of God are recognized by the love they manifest one for another, and the absence of love among men is one of the signs of the great apostasy. Love is particularly important in the family unit. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. Each of these statements is followed by corresponding scriptural references, incidentally. Seventh, that we are eternal, progressive beings capable of becoming more like Jesus the Christ. Many who have returned from their brief visits to the spirit world, George Ritchie and William Dudley Paley included, espouse this concept. But again, Mormons above all. LDS doctrine not only reveals that we have the opportunity, but that it is also our specific responsibility. As the Savior informed the Nephites during his appearance among them following his resurrection, Therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. Becoming like Christ clearly means as well that we can and should become like God. For Christ was created in the similitude of the Divine Father, and they are united as one, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. As Christ exhorted his disciples, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Perhaps the most famous modern statement in this vein and best known among Mormons themselves is the one imparted by revelation to President Lorenzo Snow. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. 
It can therefore be seen that even though most people may have not been taught the gospel directly during their brief visits to the next realm, that many of them are exposed in a profound way to some of its most basic principles. It is, in fact, my own conviction that many of these people, sooner or later, in this realm or the next, will hear the gospel and quickly recognize its familiar spirit, that they will thrill to the grand plan of salvation which will expand their present important yet fragmentary understanding into the eternities. The near-death experience, of course, despite its immense significance, merely gives us a brief glimpse into the spirit world. At this point, therefore, one might naturally inquire, what really is the spirit world and where? What actually goes on there? I will attempt no definitive answer at this point, for complete answers are not available, even through the instrumentality of divine revelation. The following few pages from the undiscovered country by the late Apostle Orson F. Whitney, however, offer valuable insight regarding the subject. In the minds of some people, the spirit world and heaven are synonymous terms, indicating one and the same place. But in reality, there is a wide difference between them. State of rest, such as the spirit life is for the righteous, though rest is not to be interpreted as idleness or want of occupation, might easily pass for heaven when contrasted with this world of pain, sorrow, and trouble. But that is only relative. It is not saying too much. Indeed, it may be saying too little to affirm that there is just as much difference between the spirit world and heaven as between the mortal and spiritual phases of man's existence. According to Parley P. Pratt, the spirit world is the spiritual part of this planet, or, to use his exact language, the earth and other planets of a like order have their inward or spiritual spheres as well as their outward or temporal. The one is peopled by temporal tabernacles and the other by spirits. As to its location, he says, it is here on the very planet where we were born. Parley P. Pratt, a modern apostle, was Joseph Smith's disciple, sitting at his feet as Paul at the feet of Gamaliel. That masterly treatise, The Key to Theology, is based upon principles divinely revealed to the founder of the Church of Christ in this dispensation. The proposition that earth has a spiritual as well as a temporal sphere is a reassertion of the great doctrine of duality embodied in ancient and modern revelation and particularly emphasized by Joseph the seer. A careful reading of the book of Genesis, the King James Version, discloses, though somewhat vaguely, the fact of this duality as applied to the works of creation. Thus, after giving an account of the origin of the earth and all things connected therewith, the sacred writer goes on to say, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Not a man to till the ground, and yet man had been created as well as the plants and herbs that existed, quote, before they grew, unquote. The apparent contradiction, apparent though not real, was explained by the prophet when he revised by the spirit of revelation the Hebrew scriptures, giving a more ample account of the creation than the ordinary Bible contains. From that account, the following sentences are taken. For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. And I, the Lord God, had created all the children of men, and not yet a man to till the ground. For in heaven created I them, and there was not yet flesh upon the earth, neither in the water, neither in the air. Nevertheless, all things were before created. In other words, Elder Whitney continues, 
When God made man and beast and fish and fowl, he made them twice, first in the spirit and then in the body. And the same is true of the trees, shrubs, flowers, and all other created things. They were made spiritually and temporally, the spirit and the body constituting the soul. Now, if the phrase all things includes earth itself, and that was the process of creation, we have a pretty clear idea of what constitutes the spirit world. The spirit of Mother Earth is not that the spiritual sphere referred to by Parley the Apostle. Thus considered, it is not a thing afar off. One's thoughts need not sail away millions of miles into space to find it. We have only to emerge from the body, and we are in the spirit world. Our dear departed ones are nigh unto us, and their presence is frequently felt, though they themselves may be seen and heard but rarely. Says Joseph Smith, The spirits of the just are not far from us. They know and understand our thoughts, feelings, and motions, and are often pained therewith. The spirits of the unjust likewise inhabit the spirit world, though they are separated from the righteous and are not in a state of rest. Light and darkness divide that realm, each domain having its appropriate population. So far from being heaven, part of the world of spirits is Hades, or hell. Referring to the class who people Hades, the prophet says, The great misery of departed spirits is to know that they come short of the glory that others enjoy, and that they might have enjoyed themselves, and they are their own accusers. In the spirit world, says Parley P. Pratt, are all the varieties and grades of intellectual beings which exist in the present world. For instance, Jesus Christ and the thief on the cross both went to the same place. That is to say, they both went to the spirit world. Jesus, it will be remembered, had been crucified between two thieves, one of whom derided him, insulting his dying agonies. The other, being penitent, prayed, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. To him the Savior said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Because of this utterance, which, by the way, Joseph Smith declared to be a mistranslation, maintaining that paradise should read world of spirits, well-meaning though uninspired minds have jumped to the conclusion that the penitent thief was promised immediate heavenly exaltation for repenting at the last moment and professing faith in the Redeemer. And this notion is still entertained. The criminal who has forfeited his life and is under sentence of death, because unfit to dwell among his fallen fellow creatures, is made to believe that by confessing Christ, even on the scaffold, he is fitted at once for the society of gods and angels and will be wafted to eternal bliss. Jesus never taught such a doctrine nor did any authorized servant of God. It is a man-made theory based upon faulty inference and misinterpretation. The scriptures plainly teach that men will be judged according to their works and receive rewards as varied as their deeds. It was best for the thief, of course, to repent, even in the eleventh hour, but he could not be exalted until prepared for it if it took a thousand years. When Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. He was not speaking to murderers and malefactors, but to his pure-minded, right-living disciples, the only ones to whom such a promise could consistently be given. Jesus Christ and the thief both went to the world of spirits, a place of rest for the righteous, a place of correction for the wicked. But... As the Apostle Parley goes on to say, the one was there in all the intelligence, happiness, benevolence, and charity which characterized a teacher, a messenger anointed to preach glad tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourned, to preach deliverance to the captive and open the prison to those who were bound, or, in other words, to preach the gospel to the spirits in prison. They might be judged according to men in the flesh, while the other was there as a thief who had expired on the cross for a crime and who was guilty 
ignorant, uncultivated, and unprepared for the resurrection, having need of remission of sins and to be instructed in the science of salvation. Thus is told in part what goes on in the spirit world. It is a place, continues our apostle, where the gospel is preached, where faith, repentance, and charity may be exercised, a place of waiting for the resurrection or redemption of the body, while to those who deserve it, it is a place of punishment, a purgatory or hell, where spirits are buffeted until the day of redemption. President Joseph F. Smith, only a short while before his death, saw in a vision of the redemption of the dead the Savior's visit to the world of spirits, as recorded in the first epistle of Peter, and the President's account of what he beheld follows. I saw the hosts of the dead, both small and great, and there were gathered together in one place an innumerable company of the spirits of the just. They were filled with joy and gladness, and were rejoicing together because the day of their deliverance was at hand. The Son of God appeared and preached to them the everlasting gospel. I perceived that the Lord went not in person among the wicked and disobedient, who had rejected the truth to teach them. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of man. I beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation, when they depart from mortal life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel among those who are in darkness and under the bondage of sin in the great world of the spirits of the dead. The new light here thrown upon the subject proceeds from the declaration that when the Savior visited the inhabitants of the spirit world, it was by proxy and not in person, so far as the wicked were concerned. He ministered to the righteous directly and to the unrighteous indirectly, sending to the latter his servants bearing the authority of the priesthood, duly commissioned to speak and act in his name instead. President Smith's pronouncement modifies the view commonly taken that the Savior's personal ministry was to both classes of spirits. Thus we see that the spirit world is not heaven, only in a relative sense, and even then only in part. It is merely a temporary abode for God's children while undergoing processes of purification and development as a preparation for better things beyond. Heaven, on the other hand, heaven in the highest degree is the permanent home of the perfected and glorified. This is the end of side three. Please continue listening on side four. Long ago, at the tender age of four or five, I had a recurrent dream. In that dream, I was walking alone down a long, dusty road in the hot sunlight, a road that always terminated at a high wall containing the following words in immense black letters, THE END. Those, in fact, were the only words I could read. They had a way of appearing on the final pages of certain books, and my mother told me what they meant. Standing there in my dream before that wall, however, I always felt a great frustration because I knew, absolutely knew, that if somehow I could climb to the top and see beyond, it would not be the end, after all. The end of the road, perhaps, but surely not the end of everything. Just as there had always been something before the wall, there would always be something after Many years elapsed before I realized the full significance of that dream. The wall and its word symbolized death, and the road, all of my prior existence. The area on the other side that I could not see symbolized the life to come. Today I understand with increasing excitement and clarity how well that little dream ties in with the restored gospel and its mighty doctrine of eternal progression, how fundamental a part it is of my testimony in that connection. Despite its great significance, the death experience as discussed to this point is 
but a brief phase of a divinely ordained program without beginning or end. Indeed, it is vital that we see it in that perspective in order to comprehend who we truly are and what we may become. In his King Follett Discourse, perhaps the greatest sermon ever delivered on this subject, Joseph Smith struck at the essence of our eternal nature with the following analogy. I take my ring from my finger and liken it unto the mind of man, the immortal part, because it has no beginning. Suppose you cut it in two. Then it has a beginning and an end. But join it again and it continues one eternal round. Within the vast panorama of the gospel, this concept of eternal duration, non-beginning and non-ending, is indeed the law and the prophets. And ultimately, all doctrine and practice, thought and action, derive meaning within that context. As John Taylor stresses, we believe in eternal principles, in an eternal gospel, an eternal priesthood, in eternal communications and associations. Everything associated with the gospel that we believe in is eternal. If it were not so, I would want nothing to do with it. Our belief that the mind of man or human personality is without beginning or ending may seem incomprehensible to us at this stage of existence. Nevertheless, it is entirely consistent with what we believe about the nature of time, space, and matter. Such things nearly everyone agrees have always been and will always be. And so it is with the conscious part of our being that can recognize and reflect upon them. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. It follows as well that if the personality is eternal, it must also be capable of eternal development, as the Mormon philosopher Nels Nelson has explained. The fact that I had no beginning as an ego, that I am ultimately a free agent, that I am moving upward in a scale of psychic evolution, but may move downward, should I so will, and that I may win heaven and immortality, these things appeal to me with the same inevitableness with which I sense the infinitude of space, time, and causation. What this ego or pre-existent personality may have looked like, and what physical or material properties it may have had, if any, is a matter of conjecture. It is certain, though, that at some point it was clothed with a spiritual body and literally born as the offspring of God. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. The words of Paul in his famed sermon before the Athenians on Mars Hill, which he elaborated as follows in his epistle to the Romans. The Spirit itself beareth witness with ours that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if it so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. We also know that our spirit bodies are composed of a refined form of matter normally invisible to the mortal eye and capable of inhabiting our present earthly bodies. As Joseph Smith once explained, there is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but it is more fine or pure and can only be discerned by purer eyes. We cannot see it, but when our bodies are purified, we shall see that it is all matter. As the spirit children of our Divine Father, we were participants in the grand heavenly council described by Abraham. There the plan of earth life, as advanced by the Savior, was enacted, one opposed by Lucifer who demanded the forfeiture of our free agency and total regimentation. And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those who were with him, we will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith, to see if they will do all things, whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. 
and they who keep their first estate shall be added upon, and they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep their first estate, and they who keep their second estate shall have glory added upon their heads for ever and ever. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, I will send the first. And the second was angry and kept not his first estate. And at that day many followed after him. This great transition in living conditions became essential so that we might test our mettle in the face of immense new challenges, prove ourselves in the grand and sometimes terrifying school of mortality. Without such a challenge, we would have stagnated, ultimately found ourselves in a state of damnation. Relatedly, it was necessary for us to acquire a physical body and become familiar with earthly matter. Consider John A. Widsow's observations in this connection. The kind of matter characteristic of this earth also forms an important part of the universe. No spirit can acquire a real mastery over the universe until this form of matter is thoroughly understood as to be used and governed. The next step in the education of these intelligent beings was therefore to teach them familiarity with gross matter. Consequently, the spirit beings passed out of the spirit world and were born into the world of earthly things, the bodies consisting of gross matter, so that intimate familiarity with nature and the possibilities of substances of earth might be acquired. This is called the second estate of man. Upon leaving this sphere, we shed our grosser elements and revert to that more ethereal spirit matter to which the prophet Joseph Smith referred. And radical though that transition may seem, the world of spirits is much like this one in most respects. Through modern revelation, as mentioned previously, we are informed that I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. In other words, Mormon philosophy is distinctly dualistic, stressing that each of God's earthly creations, people, beasts, plants, etc., possesses its spiritual counterpart, as Apostle Orson F. Whitney explained earlier. I reiterate here his vital conclusion. Thus considered, it is not a thing afar off. One's thoughts need not sail away millions of miles into space to find it. We have only to emerge from the body and we are in the spirit world. Our dear departed ones are nigh unto us, and their presence is frequently felt, though they themselves may be seen and heard, but rarely. Nor, according to the gospel, is the spirit realm some vague domain in which people either spend their time strumming harps or drifting about in a state of blissful aimlessness. The social relationships and modes of living are, in fact, much the same there, in the fourth dimension, as they are here. Here again, as well, the words of Brigham Young in this connection. Yes, brethren, they are there together, and if they associate together and collect together in clans and societies, as they do here, it is their privilege. No doubt they yet more or less see, hear, converse, and have to do with each other both good and bad. And then he adds, We have more friends behind the veil than on this side, and they will hail us more joyfully than you were ever welcomed by your parents and friends in this world. And you will rejoice more when you meet them than you ever rejoiced to see a friend in this life. Such assurances are indeed inspiring and comforting, and they tie in compellingly with the evidence discussed in previous chapters regarding the spirit world. Even more significant, however, is our awareness that the true gospel is also being preached in the next realm, that those who died without an opportunity to hear and accept it in mortality will yet have that chance, as has also been explained. Thus, we can see, revealed information about the spirit world is quite detailed, 
and the same holds true regarding the resurrection. Here again, Joseph F. Smith offers great solace and enlightenment. You are entities. You have living souls within you, and you will be raised from the dead just as surely as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. As sure as by Adam you die, so sure by Christ will you be raised from the dead. This is inevitable. It is according to God's plan. He has decreed it. And you cannot help yourselves. Do what you may. You cannot dodge that. It will come just as surely as birth and death come. The resurrection will come to all the children of men. The Latter-day Prophets have always spoken with assurance upon this subject, regardless of how mankind at large may vacillate, regardless of ridicule, the prophets persist in voicing their sturdy, unabashed testimony of the resurrection, a fact movingly exemplified in the following by Joseph Smith. So plain was the vision that I actually saw men, before they had ascended from the tomb, as though they were getting up slowly, they took each other by the hand and said to each other, My father, my son, my mother, my daughter, my brother, my sister. And when the voice calls for the dead to arise, suppose I am laid by the side of my father. What would be the first joy of my heart? To meet my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, and when they are by my side, I embrace them, and they me. It is my meditation all the day, and more than my meat and my drink, to know how I shall make the saints of God comprehend the visions that roll like an overflowing surge before my mind. It is impossible to read such words without being deeply moved and excited, without sensing to some extent at least the beauty and reality of the resurrection. Surely it will be a time of bounteous uplift and joy, the following millennium a thrilling period in which to live. Brigham Young offers some fascinating insight here. In the millennium, when the kingdom of God is established on earth in power, glory, and perfection, and the reign of wickedness that has so long prevailed is subdued, the saints of God will have the privilege of building their temples and entering into them, becoming, as it were, pillars in the temples of God, and they will officiate for their dead. Then we will see our friends come up, and perhaps some that we have been acquainted with here. If we ask, who will stand at the head of the resurrection in this last dispensation, the answer is, Joseph Smith, Jr., the prophet of God. He is the man who will be resurrected and receive the keys of the resurrection, and he will seal this authority upon others, and they will hunt up their friends and resurrect them when they shall have been officiated for and bring them up. And we will have revelations to know our forefathers clear back to Father Adam and Mother Eve, and we will enter into the temples of God and officiate for them. Then man will be sealed to man until the chain is made perfect back to Adam, so that there will be a perfect chain of priesthood from Adam to the winding up scene. Members of the church are urged to perform all the work possible for their dead here and now. As explained above, however, the millennium will be an excellent time for genealogy and temple work, providing information from on high which could not otherwise have been obtained. It will mark the fruition of efforts steadily mounting with remarkable force, not only among Latter-day Saints, but genealogically speaking, people throughout the world. We are also told that the millennium will be a period of adjustment and compensation. Joseph Smith, for example, has made this consoling promise. All your losses will be made up to you in the resurrection, provided you continue faithful. By the vision of the Almighty, I have seen it. This statement appears to be all-inclusive, in keeping with the prophet's promise that parents who have lost children in mortality will have the blessing of rearing them to maturity in the resurrection. It is also consistent with Joseph Fielding Smith's assurance that, quote, we need not worry 
because young men or young women die without being married. All who are worthy will be blessed just the same as if they had lived and obtained the blessings. Add to all this the awareness that we shall come forth radiantly immortal, perfect of mind and body, regardless of handicaps here, and the millennium becomes a glorious prospect indeed. It is in this resurrected condition that we will ultimately inherit the heaven, or glory for which we have qualified, a fact set forth at length in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 76. Known as the Three Degrees of Glory, or the Vision, this revelation to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon is among the most profound ever given. Perhaps more has been written and said, in fact, about this remarkable vision than any other passage of modern scripture. To summarize briefly, however, the account describes a variety of conditions which man may attain depending upon his spirituality and determination to comply with universal law. These gradations of advancement or degrees of glory are classified as telestial, terrestrial, and celestial in order of increasing prominence and are compared respectively to the stars, moon, and sun. Each degree, in turn, is divided into subcategories, as John A. Widso elaborates. Within each glory, composed of innumerable beings, there appear to be several, perhaps many, degrees to fit the gradations of attainment or capacity among various groups. It is somewhat like the practice of some universities. All who have fulfilled the requirements are graduated with the same degree and are made members of the Alumni Association. But some receive upon their diploma added commendation, according to the excellence of their work, with honors, or with high honors, or with highest honors. Or perhaps a better comparison, some have qualified in addition to the general requirements for professional service in one of many activities of society. So, in the celestial glory, all faithful persons will receive some degree of exaltation, but not all full exaltation. Surely this concept of gradations and varying rates of progression seems logical and in keeping with our present experience. If one believes in a wise and loving Creator, in fact, the concept hardly needs defense. In the words of James E. Talmage, that every soul shall find his place in the hereafter, that he shall be judged and assigned according to what he is, is no less truly scriptural than reasonable. He shall inherit according to his capacity to receive, enjoy, and utilize. The vision informs us that each degree will surpass the limits of finite imagination in splendor. The term glory attached to each seems to imply this. Nevertheless, members of the church are always encouraged to aim high, to seek the celestial, for it is there only the highest level of that degree, in fact, that men and women may attain the full stature of godhood with the power of eternal increase the ability to organize worlds and procreate infinite numbers of spirit offspring to inhabit them. As Widso explains, it is a reward of intelligent development that we may become to other spiritual beings what our God has been to us. As stated previously, Lorenzo Snow has summarized the concept in these words, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. This inspired couplet, recapitulating earlier utterances by Joseph Smith, sets forth the most important knowledge ever acquired regarding the purpose and possibilities of our existence. It looms as the ultimate human aspiration and is so momentous and thrilling that all other goals, all other philosophies regarding the nature and destiny of man seem pale by comparison. Such doctrine explodes the mind. It is so foreign to conventional religious views regarding our relationship to deity that most people refuse even to consider it. 
Instead, they thrust it aside as preposterous, indeed blasphemous. Only an extremely open and creative individual will honestly ponder the matter without being carefully acclimatized beforehand. Nevertheless, the man-to-God concept, like that of eternal duration already discussed, swiftly becomes more rational when related to certain facts of science. Today, despite all his mortal limitations, man walks in space, stands upon the moon in view of distant millions, orbits his own small worlds and dwells within them for a year at a time. He maps the face of distant planets via telescope and satellites with sophisticated cameras. In time, he will colonize them. He has harnessed the power of the atom, achieved astounding advancements in medicine, and through the growing miracle of computerization has a world of knowledge at his fingertips. Ironically, he has already achieved wonders he would have denied a god with physical form and limitations only a few decades earlier. As Archibald MacLeish has said, ours is one of the great ages of history, an age in which all the old impossible heroic myths have come true. If, therefore, we can accomplish such remarkable things in this brief mortal sojourn, and if we can progress eternally, eventually, Godhood seems almost inevitable in things technological. Whether we can realize equivalent moral and spiritual advancement is another question, but the restored gospel alone holds forth that promise and offers the program. In the words of B. H. Roberts, What such a redeemed soul may become by accepting the truth and living it, with God and good men as friends and guides, and also an eternity in which to work out the problems of existence, opens a field of thought that is very inviting. Unquestionably, such a philosophy infuses life with richer meaning. To become gods and goddesses, we must belong to God's church, marry in the temple for eternity, pay our tithes and offerings, live the word of wisdom in spirit and letter, and so on. Yet such things, vital as they are, will not be enough. In the words of our Savior, we must become perfect, even as God is perfect, and truly come to know Him, again as He has assured us, and this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Such perfection and knowing clearly require that eventually we must learn what God and Christ have learned and do what they have done. We must also steadfastly nurture the great godly virtues of love, faith, humility, compassion, sacrifice, generosity, loyalty, courage, wisdom, creativity, and so on. In addition, we must completely vanquish the desire to sin. This thought at times is mind-boggling, almost overwhelming. Lest we despair in the face of such demands, however, it should be remembered that much of our knowledge regarding God and the universe is temporarily obscured by the veil of mortality. We must also bear in mind that the most important objectives are gained a step at a time. The ski jumper, soaring hundreds of feet to land upon the slope below, did not achieve that remarkable feat upon his first attempt. Initially, he may have had difficulty in merely standing, and the first death-defying leap was probably made from a foot-high mogul. The marathon runner may have begun training with a jog around the block, the jet pilot launching a tiny paper airplane as a child, our great religious leaders, philosophers, scientists, statesmen, and artists all began this life, like everyone else, in utter ignorance and helplessness. Yet in their halting progress, from infancy to adulthood, they have already become quite godlike in many ways compared to what they were. And so, in somewhat lesser degree, it is with all of us. The following by Joseph F. Smith is very appropriate here. 
What a glorious thought is inspired in the heart when we read sentiments like this, that even Christ himself was not perfect at first. He received not a fullness at first, but he received grace for grace and continued to receive more and more until he received a fullness. Is not this to be so with the children of men? Is any man perfect? Has any man received a fullness at once? Have we reached a point wherein we may receive the fullness of God, of his glory and his intelligence? No. And yet, if Jesus, the Son of God, received not a fullness at first, but increased in faith, knowledge, understanding, and grace until he received a fullness, is it not possible for all men that are born of women to receive little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, until they shall receive a fullness, as he has received a fullness, and be exalted with him. Such may be our progress, if we care enough, and continually try our best, line upon line, precept upon precept, a little at a time, until at last the once formidable barriers are overcome, the monumental goals attained. It is basically a matter of learning from the past, planning for the future, and living for today. How profoundly this concept of Godhood affects our self-image and our attitude toward others. What a premium it places upon endless learning, for it is impossible for man to be saved in ignorance. And the more knowledge and intelligence he attains unto in this life, the greater his advantage in the world to come. Clearly, our doctrine of eternal progression and godhood makes mortal parenthood a grave, at times frightening, responsibility. But it also invests it with immense meaning, richness, and joy. The same may be said of its effect upon the relationship between those parents. Although partners joined for time and all eternity may not always exist in perfect harmony, and even though some of those unions admittedly fail, their chances for success from the beginning of courtship onward are greatly magnified. When the venerable Le Grand Richards once asked his wife what she thought they'd be doing, quote, a million years from now, unquote, he drew a laugh from the others present. Yet everyone, his wife especially, knew that he was speaking literally. They understood from their own personal experience, in fact, how such a long-range perspective adds luster and significance even to the most minute and commonplace aspects of existence. Properly understood, in fact, this eternal perspective will enhance the entire family relationship, including that among brothers and sisters. For the family unit, sealed in the right place by the proper authority, may endure forever. Simultaneously, we must recognize that our children and other family members are not our possessions. They are the offspring of God, whom he has entrusted to our loving care, with the primary responsibility of helping them to fulfill in every way possible their divine potential. The same philosophy should also promote peace and harmony in the world. With its emphasis upon the literal fatherhood of God, it must also emphasize the literal brotherhood of man. With its emphasis on our godly possibilities, it must also emphasize the need for unified righteous effort. With its emphasis on genealogy and temple work for the dead, it must emphasize that the family of man is not restricted to this finite existence. Through our efforts in behalf of those now gone, we truly may, in the words of Malachi, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children the hearts of the children to their fathers. In the process, we affirm a continuing relationship and interdependency between ourselves and our loved ones beyond. As the gospel is accepted there and the ordinance is performed here, our family units are grafted in, branch upon branch, generation upon generation. Such branches can be traced down to limbs of increasingly common ancestry, eventually reaching the trunk and at length the heavenly roots from whence they sprang. Surely in the light of such knowledge also there is no need to fear death, for it is as essential to our long-term success and happiness as birth is. 
Composure and optimism in the face of death, in fact, have always been the hallmarks of prophetic revelation and the true gospel. In the meridian of time, in fact, they were one of the important distinctions between the pagan and the Christian. For the latter, as Hugh Nibley explains, amazed the world by the robust and joyful assurance with which he viewed the things of the other world. The following, from the Apostle Paul, is but one example among many. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The same held true for converts in Book of Mormon times, who, quote, never did look upon death with any degree of terror for their hope and views of Christ and the resurrection, unquote. And it was abundantly evident among the Mormon pioneers, prevailing as they had against hardship and danger, sustained constantly by the sense of their own eternal progressive natures, such people often regarded death almost scornfully. These comments by John Taylor are illustrative. I was talking about troubles, but I don't know that we need talk or care about them. We have had some little amusements and frolics among the Gentiles, some few difficulties, but we have struggled through them all, and we are here, safe and sound. True, some of our friends have dropped by the way. They have fallen asleep. But what of that? And who cares? It is as well to live as to die, or to die as to live, to sleep as to be awake, or to be awake as to sleep. It is all one. They have only gone a little before us. For example, we have left other parts and come here, and we think we have got to Zion. They have gone to the world of spirits, and they think they have got to heaven. It is all right. We have left some of our family behind in various places. When they arrive here, they will shake hands with us and be glad they have got to Zion. And when we go to where our departed friends are gone, we shall strike hands with them and be glad we have got to heaven. So... It is all one. Though not always voiced so boldly, the attitude remains strong in the church to this day. In the statement on that subject, quoted earlier from Spencer W. Kimball, that we knew before we came here that we were coming to earth for bodies and experiences, for joys and sorrows, and that we accepted it with a glad heart and without complaint. This seems intensely relevant. Just as eternal progression entails birth and death, it also entails the surmounting of other obstacles, which sometimes involve struggle and suffering. While few of us, if any, may welcome such experiences, we know simultaneously that they are fundamental to our advancement, and that nothing, even the seedling within the earth, or the butterfly within its cocoon, develops properly without a degree of stress or pressure. Deprived of opposition, trials, and pain, our lives become neuter and meaningless. We are like a goldfish in the tepid waters of a bowl, swimming in aimless security but never growing, as Father Lehi has advised us. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must needs be compounded in one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption nor incorruption, happiness nor misery, neither sense nor insensibility. It is not, however, the opposition or suffering as such that produces development. It is our response, what we learn and what we become in the process. Nor is it always a matter of victory. 
in the traditional sense. It is also one of courage and tenacity, even in the hour of our greatest tribulation, which, in the end, becomes its own enormous victory. In the words again of John Taylor, We read again of a certain man who, while enwrapped in a vision, saw many of the purposes of God roll forth. And among other things, he saw a number that were clothed in white raiment and who were engaged in singing a new song. Upon inquiring who those persons were, he was told that they had come up through much tribulation. There are occasions, in fact, when it seems that we must be reduced to complete dependency, when momentarily we must flounder and cry out like Peter in the waves. Thus we descend to the very nadir of our suffering, that time in which, having reached the complete saturation level of humility, we must acknowledge total, unqualified dependence upon our Creator. It was in this spirit that the Savior Himself pled to have the bitter cup of His suffering removed, and that He later cried out in anguish upon the cross. It was during the depths of his suffering in the dungeon at Liberty, Missouri, that Joseph Smith received the following divine assurance, one of the most moving passages in all of modern scripture. And if thou shouldst be cast into the pit, or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness, and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee. Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he. Fortified with the doctrine of eternal progression and godhood, we may not always face death and suffering with perfect faith and courage, but how different our overall attitude from that of society in general! How much greater our chances of avoiding the disillusionment and fear of the world! How much greater our faith, hope, and peace of mind! In light of these considerations, Perhaps we can better comprehend why Joseph Smith himself placed such a premium upon an understanding of our immortality with its immense challenges and glorious opportunities, as he has explained. All men know that they must die, and it is important that we should understand the reasons and causes of our exposure to the vicissitudes of life and of death, and the designs and purposes of God in our coming into the world our suffering here, and our departure hence. What is the object of our coming into existence than dying and falling away to be here no more? It is but reasonable to suppose that God would reveal something in reference to the matter, and it is a subject we ought to study more than any other. We ought to study it day and night. And if we have any claim on our Heavenly Father for anything— it is for knowledge on this important subject. Most important of all, in comprehending God's designs and purposes for His children, we comprehend increasingly the nature of God Himself. For as man now is, God once was. And as Joseph Smith adds, My father worked out his kingdom in fear and trembling, and I must do the same. Our Creator is an exalted man in the most literal sense, instead of an ephemeral essence. Modern revelation offers a substantial personage instead of some vast indecipherable, a dedicated teacher, instead of a deity manipulating us for no discernible reason, the most devoted of all fathers, bent upon sharing every blessing he enjoys or will enjoy with his children. For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. God's grandest purpose, in other words, is to help his children become what he is, to share all that he has. 
and with what empathy our Father must view our own hopes and struggles, our joys and sorrows, for He has journeyed the entire course, groped His way in cold and darkness, swum the rivers, traversed desert and forest, found His isles of respite, and climbed the highest mountain into the sunrise. How this Father excites our adoration and appreciation, our admiration and allegiance. Caught within the tide of this realization, one can scarcely resist hallelujahs and hymns of praise. Indeed, we should not resist any more than the psalmist resisted, not in the right time and place, and not by day and by night in our hearts.